From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie, and welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Next hour, Ghost to Ghost begins right here on Coast to Coast AM. Well, computer makers are recalling 100,000 laptop battery packs made by the Sony Corporation after 40 reports now of overheating. This is according to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. The voluntary recall applies to certain Sony 2.15 lithium-ion cell batteries made in Japan and sold around the world in laptops made by Hewlett Packard and Dell and Toshiba. Some incidents involve smoke or flames, according to Sony. 21 of the reports claim minor damage and small burns reported in four cases. So just check out your batteries. Several minor earthquakes gave some Texas and Oklahoma residents an early Halloween scare. No damage or injuries reported there. 2.5 magnitude, 3.0 magnitude. A Warren County, Ohio magistrate said he'll decide Saturday whether Ohio Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner has to get proof that Barack Obama was born in the United States. David M. Neal, who runs a political website, filed suit last week saying state and federal government leaders have failed to verify that Obama was born in Hawaii instead of Kenya. The U.S. Constitution requires presidents to be natural-born citizens who are at least 35 years old. Well, the longest daylight saving time period in American history ends Sunday, November 1st, when all states except for Hawaii, most of Arizona, and parts of Indiana will dial back the clock one hour. So you do that Saturday night just when you're ready to go to bed. Actor Patrick Swayze has said that undergoing chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer was hell on wheels. The 56-year-old star told the New York Times that he's still going through a battle zone despite a return to acting following intensive treatment. He says, I'm proud of what I'm doing, said Swayze, who's playing the lead in a television police drama called The Beast. I ran into him before his treatment started in Los Angeles, and at that time he looked pretty good, actually. And, uh, you know, now obviously, you know, he's been battling this. In Michigan... Moments after rolling the first perfect 300 game of his life in bowling, Don Doan collapsed on the floor while high-fiving his teammates. The 62-year-old was taken to a local hospital, could not be saved. A medical examiner determined that a heart attack killed him. But man, what a way to go. They call it phantom clowns, and there apparently have been sightings of these things. Cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman on the line with us now. Lauren, what are these sightings? Well, these sightings are of clowns uh, supposedly carrying balloons. This has happened in the Chicago area starting October 7th, October 10th of this year. Uh, And they're they're said to approach children, try to kidnap them, and the children are running away and uh, calling 911. And I coined the term phantom clowns uh, in 1981 when we had a wave of these in Boston all the way to Kansas City. Uh, The local communities didn't know that it was a national phenomenon. I heard about it through my correspondence and exchanging uh, news clippings and different things like that. But uh, I call them phantoms, of course, because they're never caught. They're seen uh, in these vans with broken windows or a a ladder on them, and uh, yet uh, the police can never capture them. Lauren, how come there isn't any widespread media coverage on this? I don't know. I, I think that it's always seemed to be some kind of local phenomena, almost uh, at the level of hysteria. But yet local communities, police officers, and school districts take it very seriously. They send alerts out. They send uh, community neighborhood alerts out. And yet we never hear about it nationally. Now, right now, is this restricted primarily to the Illinois area specifically near Chicago? Yeah. I'm hearing that it's uh, spreading down to uh, the Bloomington area, uh, you know, from the Chicago area. And then also I just got a new report that one of these was seen in Seattle, in the Seattle area. So it may be something that uh, could be spreading and jumping. Absolutely somewhere. bizarre. So the warning yeah. here, take heed. If somebody dressed like a clown comes up to a child or your child, don't go with the clown. Right, Lauren? 
Right. Go to a police officer. Go to a responsible adult. And there's a story about this on CryptoMundo.com. Lauren Coleman. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, George. Happy Halloween. You too, my friend. Campaigners in London plan to petition the British government for a posthumous pardon for the hundreds of people executed for witchcraft between the 16th and 18th centuries. They said that Halloween is a good time to highlight the grave miscarriage of justice suffered by the men and women falsely accused of being witches. Their petitions ask a justice minister, Jack Straw, to recommend that Queen Elizabeth II pardon them. The Bell Witch, a ghost story from Southern folklore, the legend of the Bell Witch, also called the Bell Witch Haunting, revolves around strange events allegedly experienced by the Bell family of Adams, Tennessee in 1817 and again in 1935 when the so-called witch had promised to return. What does this all mean? Pat Fitzhughes joins us as we talk about the Bell Witch, the full account, next on Coast to Coast AM. Pat Fitzhugh has researched the legend of the Tennessee's infamous Bell Witch for 30 years, and many consider this to be the world's scariest haunting. Pat's research has led him to official records, old manuscripts, and interviews with people from around the world. Pat has played a consultative role in numerous made-for-television documentaries and has written paranormal phenomena in newspapers, magazines all around the world. Author of The Bell Witch, the full account, here he is this hour on Coast to Coast. Pat, happy Halloween to you, my friend. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. And happy Halloween to you, too. Good, good. The Bell Witch. When did you first hear the Bell Witch legend? I first heard it as a small child. My mother would read me the Bell Witch stories. It scared me to death, but it intrigued me at the same time. And then later on, I learned that the people and places mentioned in the legend were real. And that's when I began researching it, you know, from a more serious standpoint. And I've been uh, researching it ever since. Tell us about the legend, Pat. Well, the legend involves the John Bell family of the Red River Settlement in Middle Tennessee. Now, back in 1817, John Bell noticed a strange animal in his cornfield, and it had the head of a rabbit and the body of a dog. And he fired a shot, and it just vanished. Not vanished in terms of running away, but just plain vanished. Then a short time thereafter, the family began experiencing a series of knocking sounds on the walls of their house late at night. And they would go out to try and catch the culprit, but wouldn't find anyone. Yet they would hear the knocking sounds continue. So it was like the knocking sounds were coming from inside of the walls themselves. Then after that, a short time after that, the kids began complaining about their bed covers being pulled. Oh and we, uh, and when they would resist, their faces would be slapped by an invisible hand. And there were welts and visible prints all over their faces. Then a short time later, this thing gathered more energy and began beating the youngest daughter, Betsy Bell, and uh, allegedly tying her hair in knots, uh, making her vomit brass pins, and just going to all kinds of trances and uh, other other strange uh, positions. Then, at the same time all this was going on, uh, it, it began to develop a voice, uh, first as a small, very quiet whisper, and later on as a full-fledged voice that you could actually understand. And people would ask this thing what it was and what it wanted and why it was tormenting everybody, and all I could say uh, well, it would say a different thing each time they asked. It's like it was playing a game with them. Sent them on a lot, a lot of wild goose chases. Then one thing it said that stood out in particular was that they wanted to kill the patriarch of the family, John Bell. But it never said why. Then as time went on, uh, the word got out and visitors would come from all around. And they, too, could experience this phenomena going on in the Bell, Bell household. And later, it spread throughout the Red River community where this invisible or seemingly invisible entity would attend church services and tell the local gossip, uh, would tell visitors to the Bell home about their pasts and predict the future and just all sorts of wonderful things. But at the same time, uh, tormenting the Bell children, especially Betsy Bell and Mr. Bell, uh, John Bell. Did it get John Bell eventually? Because I had heard that he had suffered frequent facial seizures. 
And one day they gave him some medicine, and he died right after that, right? Okay, well, the, the Bell Witch entity uh, is credited by many people as being the, the killer of John Bell. He died in December of 1820, and uh, according to the legend, uh, they found a vial of strange liquid, strange liquid, dark liquid, sitting next to his bed. And the family didn't know where it came from. They summoned the local doctor. He came. He didn't know what it was. And one of John Bell's sons poured some of it on his finger and rubbed it on their cat's tongue. And the cat died immediately. Oh, my. And according to the legend, the entity spoke up at that time and said, well, I gave John Bell a dose of that last night, and it fixed him. And then it began singing was very, very happy about the death of John Bell and reportedly even sang songs, happy, cheerful songs, as he was being lowered into the ground at his funeral. Now, when, did people see the entity, Pat, or did they just hear it? Well, they mostly heard it. Uh, the entity uh, claimed uh, on several occasions that it liked to manifest in the form of a rabbit. And there were several instances where people would report seeing rabbits acting strangely, and then later on the entity would say, well, that was me. Uh, also, on one occasion, the Bell children saw a very uh, strange, very distant-looking old lady walking about the uh, pear orchard behind the house. And as they approached her to say hello, she walked behind a tree and they never saw her again. Then there's also the story of where... Uh, some of the family were hiking through the woods, and they came up on this tree, and there was a lady hanging from the tree, uh, dead. And then they ran, and they looked back, and she wasn't there. So there have been some uh, apparitions, uh, but mainly this thing was, you know, a poltergeist-type entity, at least in the early stages, with a lot of uh, furniture being shifted, banging on the walls, and things like that. And then later it on... It got to where it would talk. And this was around 1817, but then somewhere around 1935, this entity resurrected somehow, did it? Okay, well, it, it, it left in 1821 after it broke up Betsy Bell and her, her boyfriend where they couldn't get married, then reappeared in 1828 for about three weeks, had some serious conversations with John Bell Jr., and then promised to return in 1935. And whether it returned or not really depends on who you talk to. Um, I know my mother was alive and well and lived right there uh, in 1935, and she said that, you know, she didn't know anything about the thing ever returning. But there were some old-timers who, you know, many years ago told me that uh, the thing had returned, that things, strange things began happening, and, you know, some people say it never left the place to begin with because there's always been strange things going on up there. Pat, why did they call this entity a witch? Okay, Back then, any time people, especially in this, this area of the South, encountered something that they didn't understand and which was, they felt was more powerful than they were, they would attribute it to witchcraft. have got to remember that this was roughly 125 years after the Salem witch trials, and several people who later wrote about their firsthand eyewitness experiences with this entity referred to it as a witch, even though personally I don't feel that it was a witch, or the result of witchcraft for that matter, but that was the name that they gave it, and that's what has stuck. This this entity, whatever it was, um, you're an expert on this. You know, you've got a website devoted to it, bellwitch.com. You've written a book about it, The Bell okay. Witch, The Full Account. Okay, yeah, it was bellwitch.org. I'm, I'm sorry. D .org? Okay, fine. Uh, we'll, and we'll correct that because we've got .com on the website ours. But what do you think it was, Pat? Well, it's hard to pin down exactly what it was. I know a lot of people say it was a poltergeist, and although it did exhibit poltergeist-like characteristics throughout the entire haunting, especially in the earlier stages, in the later stages, it exhibited behavior that would suggest more of a, a demonic presence. Uh, for example, at one point, it divided itself into four, broke itself into four distinct entities. And there was a hierarchy where one entity was over the others. And a lot of books I've read and study I've done have suggested that demon families uh, are arranged in such, such a hierarchy. 
And also, this thing had a propensity for discussing and arguing religion. And it, sa- it is said that no matter what scripture a preacher could quote to this thing, it could quote another scripture to contradict it or to argue back. And you know, I found in a lot of studies I've done on demonology, things like that, that demons have a very, very thorough knowledge of the scripture. So I don't think it was just a poltergeist. I think it was a lot of different things involved there. You know, EVP sounds are sometimes very difficult to hear when we hear them on tape. But I understand that the people who heard this bell witch heard a pretty f- understandable voice, didn't they? Yes, according to the legend, they you know it took a year or two for the for the voice to fully materialize, and when it spoke, it allegedly spoke in low musical tones when it was content, and very high shrill tones when it was excited. You know, it seems you know this whole entity and everything it did increased over time, like it fed off of the terror or the attention that it got. Now, did anybody ever since 1935 talk about the Bell Witch as coming back? Um, all the time, actually. I mean, Still. I, I, I receive emails all the time, plus I, I get to meet a lot of people at speaking engagements and things like that. And I'm always hearing uh, stories of Bell Witch encounters, and even, even though all of them aren't necessarily believable, a good number are, you know, simply by the way these these uh, accounts are worded, you know, that are described, rather, and where they took place. I think the most common account is, or phenomena nowadays, would be anomalous photographs. There's a lot of those out there with mist, and there's a few uh, good orb photos, uh, and uh, a lot of also... Uh, accounts of where people will see what looks like candle lights floating up and down out in a field, uh, one of the fields that used to be part of the John Bell farm, uh, you know, some stra- strange uh, incidents with some black dogs and several other things. You know, I don't think it's ever stopped there, and I'm not completely sure that what people experience today is the same entity that John Bell and his family experienced, especially when you look at what happened to them you know, literally happened to them. And then you look at what's happened to these people today where they only see and experience this entity when they're there and, you know, they're not actually beaten up. Tell me about the local woman by the name of Kate Batts. Okay, Kate Batts was the lady that lived a couple of miles from the John Bell farm. And she was in a pretty bad position because her husband was injured in some type of accident on the farm and was paralyzed. And she had to run her farm. Well she, well, she had to run the farm, and then her children helped her. And they had very, very little money as compared to a lot of other people in the settlement. And that was something I looked at in my research, you know, estate settlements to see how much all these people were worth. Right. right. And she was kind of, uh, I would say, frowned upon by the community. Uh, a lot of people said she was strange. And, you know, one antidote in the Bell Witch legend is that the Bell Witch claimed to be Kate Batts' witch. So people just jumped all over that, and they began, even began calling this thing Kate. But now personally, uh, off of my research, you know, I haven't found any connection at all that would, you know, suggest that she was the Bell Witch. I know a lot of people are still trying to perpetuate the myth that she had a biz- bad business deal with John Bell, and she came back to haunt him from the grave. But that business deal was actually with the Benjamin Batts, who was her brother-in-law, plus Kate Batts outlived John Bell. So uh, she's received a lot of the blame, and I don't think, you know, I don't think that she's responsible for it. The home, the Bell home, was it built on anything unusual, any kind of um, special ground? Uh, there are various uh, credible reports from uh, state of Tennessee archaeologists that uh, confirmed that there are several Native American uh, burial grounds ah. nearby. As to whether the house was built right on top, I don't know, but I know there are some burial grounds nearby. 
All right, stay with us, Pat. We're going to open up the phone lines. We're going to continue talking with you about the Bell Witch, but we'll also take phone calls if you want to talk with Pat Fitzhugh about the Bell Witch. I'm George Nori, back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Well, next hour, Ghost to Ghost begins. We'll also come right back and be talking with Pat Fitzhugh about the Bell Witch in just a moment. Now, Saturday night, of course, Ian Punnett is with us with one incredible guest, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you, George Nori, and that little Ian Punnett, too. <laughs> <laughs> They're after us, Ian. They're after us. Uh, that's great. There it is. Uh, you love Russell Targ. I know you do. Uh, yes. he, he's got his biography out, his autobiography, and uh, we're going to be talking about his life, both as the pioneer in um, in so many of the interesting science projects of the last uh, century, but also um, as a remote viewer. And this coming from Russell Targ. Now, have you, have you ever met him in person? Do you know I, have, I, I have not. I've been to so many conferences, but I haven't met him. But, you know, he was the original, as you know, he was one of the original remote viewers put together by the government. Well, you know that if you ever met him and then you saw him again, he wouldn't know you or me or anybody. Why? He has the unique um, disease of or a condition where he cannot recognize faces. It's facial blindness. Amazing. And so this is part of, of, uh, of the story of his book and about his life is, and part of the unique ability of his ESP that has developed at an early age is that he, he has this great mental vision, but his close friends always walk up and identify themselves by name, and then he knows who you are. But he, he can never remember faces and cannot recognize them. That's fantastic. It okay, have a great thing, show, my friend. Okay, but, but, happy Halloween to you, too. Thank you. You have a great show. I'm looking forward to hearing Ghost to Ghost. I'm sitting on my porch with a fire and my radio on, and I'll That's be listening to George. That's the way to do it. Thank Ian Punnett, he'll be on Saturday night, and I'll be on Sunday night, first Sunday of every month. When we come right back, let's continue talking about the Bell Witch. Take your phone calls with Pat Fitzhugh on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie, Pat Fitzhugh with us as we talk about the Bell Witch and your calls. Pat, do you think that this case will ever get solved? Well, I believe that, you know, before anyone can really say that it, the case is solved, uh, they have to formulate some criteria as to what constitutes solving the case. Um Ever since the very beginning of the legend, or when it you know when it was first commercially published back in the 1800s, people have come up with various theories and proclaimed that they've solved the legend. But other people will come in and say, "Well, no, this is not a good theory, or this couldn't have happened," and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't really know that it's going to be solved, at least not with any terms of you know universal acceptance. And I think all of that goes back to one thing, and that is different people have different standards of proof. Absolutely. Let's go to first-time caller David in Del Rio, Texas. You're on Coast to Coast with us, David. Hello there. Hey, how you doing, George? Good, good. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much. Hey, uh, pardon me, I'm a little nervous in this stuff. Uh, first-time caller here, but I uh, love you all show. It's great, uh, very informative, stuff like that. But I wanted you to check out a website uh, here, our local paper here. One of the staff photographers has got an awesome picture of an orb in a cemetery. Now, bear in mind that this particular cemetery, there's several here in Del Rio, okay? This particular one where this orb was actually uh, photographed is very, very old. It was uh, the first cemetery established here in Del Rio for its first settlers here. And unfortunately, it's very dilapidated. You know, it's it's really run down. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I, I believe it's part of the historic district here in Del Rio. Any, dates on, the, any dates on the headstones, Pat? Uh, uh, oh, David? Oh, absolutely. There's, uh, they're from the 1800s. It's like, it's, it's very old. And uh, if you log on to uh, www.delrionewsherald.com on uh, Friday, October 31st, and look up the uh, the story, A Haunting Place, I'm hoping you'll be able to see a picture of it. Like, it's, it's you know, it's headlined in our little local paper here, and uh, it's an 
you know, and, and like I was saying, this cemetery is very run down. It's very dusty. You know, this whole area here is just very dusty. And Those course, are the perfect ones, David, for hauntings like that. What is it about the 1800s, Pat? Oh, well, it's just, you know, enough time has passed that, you know, people have, uh, dis, uh, you know, ignored the graveyards. And they've fallen into an ill state of repair. And I know some researchers feel that because of that, that the paranormal activity increases possibly as a form of anger from the other side as to, you know, their graves haven't been uh, kept up. What do you think that this bizarre animal that uh, the Bell shot at, that the John Bell sh shot at, that had the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit, what significance do you think this animal played in any of this? Well, the that was the first... Uh, antidote that we know about uh, of the Bell Witch legend. And uh, there's two, two ways that, that that's been looked at. One, which is from the uh, paranormal uh, side, is that in the Native American culture, there's a spirit called Trickster. And several very knowledgeable Native Americans have told me that that sounded that and a few other apparitions sounded very much like manifestations of the trickster spirit. The other uh, angle to look at that from, uh, being the more human, you know, non-paranormal angle, is that an animal with the head of a rabbit and the body of a dog is generally referred to as a hare, H-A-R-E. At least that's, that's what they look like. Huh. All right, let's go to Knoxville, Tennessee, east of the Rockies. Hey, Matt, take it away. Hey, George. Hey, Pat. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller. Welcome. Um, my ex-wife claims to be a descendant of, uh, of the ghost that uh, lived in the house. They said she was a, an uh, Indian woman named Nancy Ward. Have you ever heard anything about that? No, I sure haven't. All right, tell um, us more, Matt. Um, I guess the story goes that um, uh, before she became incorporeal or, or whatever, she um, uh, she was supposed to have been a, a Native American shaman or something, and she uh, she changed her husband into a horse after she caught him cheating and rode him through the town square. Um, I don't know um, about the validity of it. I just wondered if you had ever heard the name Nancy Ward or. Uh, How know. about the story, Pat? Have you heard that? No, not at all, at least not connected with the Bell Witch. And one thing we have to remember about the Bell Witch haunting is that Adams, Tennessee, did not become a town until many years later. Back then, it was just a little settlement along the Red River. Uh, but I don't know of anything, you know, where a husband or anybody was changed into a horse or the name Nancy Ward. Perhaps it was something that occurred or is thought to have occurred in the area, but I don't, I've never seen any, anything along the lines of the Bell Witch in that. Interesting, though, that, it, uh, that you mentioned Native American uh, shaman built on hollowed ground there. Let's go to you, Brian, in Honolulu. You're on the air with us. Hey, Brian. How y'all doing tonight? Good. Good. Okay, I got a kind of humorous story. Um, I'm in Honolulu now, but I grew up in Clarksville, Tennessee. And when we were youngins, we'd always test our metal. Uh, there was a saying that if you ate an apple in a dark bathroom and uh, turned around three times counterclockwise and looked into the mirror and said, I hate the Bell Witch three times, that she would come out of the mirror and scratch your face. But, of course, us being so young, none of us really had, you know, we, we weren't um, brave enough to do it, but we'd sure start it. We'd just never finish it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that. I don't think there's any young person in Tennessee who hasn't tried that. And I know I tried that when I was very small myself. But the, And something bad happened to me, but I don't think it was the Bell Witch. Uh, I spun around so many times that I became dizzy and tripped and fell and busted my head all over the bathtub. So that, that was the only experience I'm afraid I had. But that whole thing about the spinning around in front of the bathroom mirror and so on and so forth... That originally came from another legend, or was associated with another legend uh, called, called uh, I believe it was Bloody Mary, and then later right. it, it somehow became adapted uh, to the Bell Witch legend. Do you believe the Bell Witch legend is indeed just that, myth and legend, or do you think there's some truth behind it, Pat? I think there's a little bit of both. I mean, there's certainly 
quite a few things that I found in my research that suggest that certain antidotes that were told were, in fact, true. Uh, at the same time, some of the antidotes that comprise this massive legend, uh, you know, they, they don't have any proof behind them. And as a researcher, you know, for me to say something is real, I have to see black and white paper. And I have to have the handwriting analyzed, the paper dated, everything before I'm going to say something is absolutely documented and true. And, you know, the part about the bell witch uh, turning the slave into a mule and riding him across the river or uh, turning a man into a rabbit, you know, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen any scientific proof that that really happened. Let's go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where Michelle is. Hey, Michelle, go ahead. Hey, guys. Happy Halloween. You too. I'd like to know whether or not the home is still there. One more time, a little louder. Um, whether the home is actually still there. Is the Bell House still there? No, no. The house has been gone for a long time, unfortunately. It was one of those old log cabins, wasn't it? Right, an old two-story log house. Next up, Nashville, Tennessee. Hey, James, take it away. You're on the air with us. Hey, glad to hear you. Sure thing. Um, there's a urban legend. I know some librarians around here about books about the Bell Witch always coming back late. And then the person will say, you know, well, it was someplace I looked a bunch of times but just never saw it. So I was wondering if you had ever heard that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, all the time. And, um, you know, I don't really know what's making those books late but a lot of you know when i go around to the libraries and do the speaking engagements and things the librarians will tell me the same thing as a matter of fact a lot of the libraries that carry my book they keep it in the reference section and they no longer allow it to be checked out because it seems like every time they do it's either very late or it just you know vanishes you know, there's there's a lot of demand for Bell Witch books. And, you, you know, people read read the book, they like it, they loan it to their friend, their friend never gives it back, and, you know, the book becomes history at that point. Have you tracked any of the family, Pat, from uh, John Bell Sr.? Oh, yeah. Uh, I even that... wonder if Art Bell's related to that. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Uh, no, actually, he's not. I looked into that a long, long time ago. Somebody had asked me that, and I believe... Uh, one of your guests one time was asking about that, too. Um, I do have a pretty extensive genealogy section. Uh, it's on the website at www.bellwitch.org. All you have to do is click on the genealogy link, and you can view it online. Or you can, if you have a PDF viewer, you can actually download the report. All right, next up, we go to Ray in Phoenix, Arizona. First-time caller. Ray, you're on with Pat. Go ahead. Well, hello, Pat. Hello, George. Long time hey. listener, first time caller. Hey, Ray. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, are you familiar with Paulus and Rhodes over in Adams? Uh, could you run it by me again? I'm sorry. I didn't catch it. That's okay. Paulus and Road in Adams. Now, uh, what, is, what, is, what is that, Ray? Uh, it's the road that parallels. It's in Adams, and it parallels the Red River. Uh, and I, uh, I moved over there in August of 1990. And you know, I guess across the river, it's about three-quarters of a mile to the Bell Witch Cave. And uh, I have a fairly large home with a big balcony, and it was real dark out there, and I had some ridgebacks, and very frequently uh, we would see orbs coming across the river from the direction of the cave. And my dogs would get all excited, and they'd run after them. And it seems like during that time frame, there were a significant number of orbs and uh, sightings, more or less film is, you know, type objects, white gauze type objects going through the woods there. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very familiar with Tolleson Road, and actually from Tolleson Road all the way back to Red River, that whole uh, bottomland corridor, whatever you want to call it there, has been notorious for orb sightings as well as even solid balls of light not just the misty uh, balls of light. Uh, I've, seen the, I've seen the solid ones, too. Uh, it's kind of interesting because the Red River Baptist Church was uh, had its 200th anniversary during that time frame in 1992. Right. And they had a significant library uh, of previous members, including the Bill family. And there were uh, notations about various uh, 
uh, objects and various things that occurred that I didn't find in other books. Unfortunately, the church burnt down a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, there was, how, how convenient. Yeah, there was a yeah. pretty pretty damaging fire, but thankfully it didn't did not destroy the entire church. Uh, the records of the Red River Baptist Church at the time of John Bell um, are available. Uh, I, I use those extensively in my research. Um, they, I know they could be found at the library in Clarksville, Tennessee. At least a transcribed copy can be. And another version of the transcribed copy, um, I bought one from a, a church member. You know, I donated some money to the church in exchange for a copy of the, the records. And I think you can get the records that way, too. But there's no mention of the Bell Witch, but there's quite a few mentions of John Bell, including the time he got uh, excommunicated or kicked out of the church, which was right during the time period of the haunting. But it wasn't, or at least it wasn't listed as because of the Bell Witch, but because of a dispute regarding the sale of a slave that he had with a man named Benjamin Batts. I thought that was pretty interesting. Couple productions leading up to the American Haunting in 2006, films based on the Bell Witch. What do you think of them? Were they accurate? Yeah, well, you know, as a researcher, that's the first thing I look at when I'm looking at a Bell Witch movie or book or anything else is the accuracy or how closely they conform with the records on file at the different museums and courthouses and things like that. Uh, one movie in particular, The Bell Witch Haunting. Uh, which was a semi-low-budget film actually made here in Middle Tennessee, I feel is the most accurate portrayal of the legend. Um, It also introduces a lot of comedy, which I think that's okay, a little comedy relief here and there, but it's very accurate historically. Then uh, you have another one that's called uh, An American Haunting. And, you know, I enjoyed American Haunting from the standpoint of it being you know, a thriller, and there was some pretty difty camera work. But in terms of historical accuracy, I didn't see a whole lot of that in there. You know, I'm not saying it was necessarily a bad movie, but I just, you know, I didn't agree with the ending, and I didn't, a lot of the events in the movie weren't too familiar to me. Okay, let's go now to Patrick in Cotton Town, ten- Tennessee, east of the Rockies. Patrick, go ahead. Hey there, how are you guys doing tonight? Good, good, great. great. Good, good. Pat, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I have had an opportunity to go out to the to the site, to the actual Bell Witch Cave area, and it's interesting. You had a caller previously that had lived right there in the area, right off Tolleson Road, I guess around the Keysburg Road area, about 1990. He noticed a lot of uh, orbs uh, happening. I don't know if you, and you probably do know this, but... Um, I went there to the cave to visit actually on Halloween night about 1990 or 91. And as you know, from time to time, you know, this, this land is sold. You know, there will be a different family who will, will buy it. And some families will, will leave it open uh, for tourists to uh, come in and actually check the cave out. Others close it down. It was interesting. This particular night, I was told that uh, the reason why it was shut down the night was that the owner of that land actually committed suicide a week previous oh to us going there. So it seemed to kind of kind of coincide with the fact that there were orbs and what have you happening there. But I also wanted to mention this, too. That whole Highway 25, and I happen to live off of Highway 25 in Cottontown, um, that whole area up there, wasn't that part of the uh, Trail of Tears? Uh, the Trail of Tears. Well, let, let me let me reverse. Hey, for just Pat, a second. we've we've got to run, but the uh, Trail of Tears. Very quickly, what was that? Uh, it was where Andrew Jackson marched the Native Americans westward. It ran about six or seven miles from uh, present day Adams, Tennessee. Ah, okay. Pat Fitzhugh, our guest. His website, bellwitch dot org. Ghost to Ghost starts in a moment. And welcome to Ghost to Ghost. I'm looking forward to this three hours of your ghostly stories. And and welcome to Ghost to Ghost. I'm looking forward to this three hours of your ghostly stories and a few surprises tossed in. So gather around the campfire and just enjoy yourself or maybe snuggle up in your bedroom, wherever you may be. And if you happen to be out driving your truck or wherever you are outside, 
well, just enjoy yourself as well. If you happen to have a computer, go to the coasttocoastam.com website. Take a look at the Digicam. There's an icon there. You'll see that. Just click that. Guess who the producer is that is wearing a mask that I bought some time ago from the guy who made the Bigfoot hoax costume. You remember that? Well, he's got a company. And before I even knew he was the guy, I ordered this mask from him. It's one of the most hideous ones I've ever seen. Well, I'll take a guess at who that is. It's not me. But uh, there it is for you at the Digicam icon at coasttocoastam.com. Hey, you know, the Spielberg film Poltergeist was cursed with the deaths of cast members. And this isn't really an urban legend. It's interesting and it's true. And the film The Exorcist was also plagued with problems, but that will be another story. Now, the story, the unusual amount of deaths have occurred around three Poltergeist films, including three of the stars. These incidents have given way to rumors that the films were cursed because of their content. This seems a little silly, doesn't it? But there are always explanations to curses like this. Or are there? Two of the stars from the first film died at very young ages. Two from the second film at not so young ages. 22-year-old Dominique Dunn, who played the older daughter Dana Freeling, died on November 4th, 1982 at Cedar sinai Medical Center in L.A. She had been choked into a coma by her boyfriend. And then 12-year-old Heather O'Rourke died of septic shock in 1988 at Children's Hospital in San Diego, what they thought was the flu turned out to be an obstruction of the bowel. Toxins entered her system. She died while undergoing surgery there. And then 60-year-old Julian Beck, who played the evil preacher Kane in the second film, he died of stomach cancer. Like Heather O'Rourke, he died during the period between filming and release. And then 53-year-old Will Sampson, who played Taylor, in the second film, died in Houston, Texas, after receiving a heart-lung transplant six weeks earlier. Was it indeed a curse? Hmm. Your phone calls, Ghost to Ghost, next on Coast to Coast AM. Hello, this is Dr. Morgus, of course, with uh, a poem from my wonderful CD album entitled Hershery Rhymes. One of my favorite poems that I put together, and uh, of course, on the organ is my assistant, Chopsley. It's called Buried Alive. Inside this coffin, I must lie and think sad thoughts until I die. They called me dead and buried me. Oh, what a dread catastrophe. When first I realized my dreadful plight, I dug my nails with all my might into this blasted wooden beer. The marks my nails made still are here. My fingers soon wore down to bone. I never had felt so alone. But still I tried my freedom to gain. I shouted till no voice remained. Once in a while from overhead... Footsteps come to respect the dead. They whisper my name and call me dear. I pound my casket, but they never hear. So now I lie here, cold as ice. How long, I wonder, will I suffice? And how many others are making a bid? To tear their caskets and flip their lid. (laughs) 
What is Halloween without Dr. Morgus, huh? His website, by the way, Morgus.com, if you want more information on his scary stories. And what's Halloween without you? First-time caller Joseph in Shiprock, New Mexico. Joseph, you have the honor of being our first caller on Ghost to Ghost. How are you? Uh, George Nori. Good morning. Good morning. So what do you have for us, Joseph? Uh, well, I uh, moved to uh, Shiprock, New Mexico about the... 2001, moved into a, a rental house, and uh, maybe about the six months into the uh, living there, started having a lot of bad nightmares in the house, a lot of uh, ghosts and monsters and, you know, things that uh, make me uh, keep the light on in the house. And did you have nightmares in the other places you had lived, or just this one? Not, not as bad, not even close to uh, this mm. place. Okay. Uh, me and, uh, the wife one morning were in the uh, bedroom and, uh, she had experiences in the house as well. Uh, we were talking about uh, work and what we're going to do. And a looked like a, a white orb of light that you can see through, uh, transparent went from one corner of the room to the next corner of the room. And we looked at each other and said, did you just see that? And we looked at each other and said, yeah, what did you see? And she described exactly what I seen. Uh, we didn't know what to do. And uh, later, before we moved out of the house, uh, my little girl started talking to uh, uh, imaginary friends in the house. And they weren't imaginary, Joseph. I uh, no. Uh, it got so bad where people started giving me things, gifts for the house. I started throwing them away, started uh, taking them out of the house because I didn't know if somebody was trying to do something or something was connected. Uh, I had people coming over to pray for the house. Uh, I'm an American uh, Indian. Uh, some of the family members uh, prayed, uh, had ceremonies in the house, and uh, it, it, it would calm down, but it would just come right back up again. And when you moved out, Joseph, did it go away? Didn't follow you, did it? No. No, we moved uh, down the road. But what, the last incident, why we moved out of the house was my little girl was actually talking and playing in the living room where there's no lights on uh, to somebody. And a couple days later, we were out of there. That was it. Uh, I don't blame you at all. Let's go to Los Angeles. Richard, you're on Ghost to Ghost. Hey, Richard. Hi. Hi, George. Uh, first time ghost to ghost, either listening or calling. So, well, welcome uh, to the show. Good night. Me, t me too. This is my first ghost to ghost as well. So we're we're sharing something then tonight. All right. Well, this is a story that happened to my friend Andy, and I'm telling it on his behalf. Um, Andy lives in Massachusetts, uh, where I'm from, with his mother in just a one story home. And about five years ago, Andy had a dream of a little girl with very light blonde hair who was standing in the middle of his basement. In fact, the way he described her, it reminded me of the little girl from Poltergeist. Uh-huh. Now, um, unfortunately, Andy wasn't able to recall what else happened in the dream, and he just shrugged it off. But a couple weeks later, Andy comes home from work, and he finds his mom sitting on the couch, and she turns and asks him if uh, he would come downstairs to do laundry with her, and that's where they kept the washer and dryer in the basement. And, uh, well, Andy turns to her and jokingly says, oh, why, did you see the little blonde girl down there? And at that point, his mother just loses all the color from her face and refused to go downstairs to do laundry for quite some time. Now, um, the only other noteworthy thing in their basement was this old billiards table that they never used anymore, and uh -huh. they kept the pool balls in the pockets. Well, Andy's watching TV one night with his girlfriend, and they hear the distinct sound of a rack of billiard balls being broken. Oh. So his girlfriend says to him, do you want to go down there and see if someone's playing or see if the balls are back in the pocket? <laughs> and he just says, no, thank you. And, and the scary thing is that they didn't even own cue sticks anymore for that table. Oh, man. Um, and, you know, another night Andy's in bed and he hears kitchen cabinets opening and closing very loudly. And the next morning, his mother said to him, Andy, if you're going to be in the kitchen that night, uh, please be quiet. So it's, it's things like this that kept up 
over the course of a full year. And actually, the, the last thing before it ended was uh, Andy woke up in the middle of the night with an itch. And uh, when he turned the light on and looked at his arm, he had the tiny handprint on his arm, like a, a, a rash in the shape of a child's hand. And uh, how this all ended was uh, one day Andy's cleaning out his closet, and in the back of the closet he finds a loose section of wall, pulls it away, and behind it there's a crawl space, a very tiny crawl space that only a child could fit into. Um, it's completely empty, though, and there's no trace of anything ever being in there. Oh, my. But Ever since he found that crawl space, there haven't been any more incidents and uh, no more sightings of a little blonde girl. Richard, they kept the little kid in that crawl space. I hope not. I really hope not. Uh, I hope not either, but it sure sounds like it. It feels like Happy it. Happy Halloween. It? You too, my friend. Oh. Let's go to Concord, New Hampshire. Bill, east of the Rockies, you're on Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast. Hey, Bill. Hi, Hi George. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, I called about a month ago, so you've heard this story, but I'm going to recap it for your listeners and okay. give you a little update. Um, as I said, about a month ago, um, me and my uh, friend were communicating over um, the Internet with you know, via webcam, which is quite common these days. Um, it began just like every other night um, where we've you know, gotten on and uh, said our hellos and our different greetings and whatnot. And uh, just recently, I moved in to an apartment, and I have a roommate, and my friend uh, knew this, that it was uh, an older woman or whatnot. And um, so we were first getting connected on the, on with our webcams, and she said, oh, um, who's, the old, who's the old lady, kind of jokingly, you know, I guess jokingly. It's kind of hard to tell, I guess, over, <laughs> over chat. But... Um, I really, did, at the time, I didn't really think much of it, I guess. And about five minutes later, I just, we're after, you know, after we were having our talks or whatnot, because I never really answered a question, because I thought she might have been joking or something like that. And uh, from the back of my mind, I'm like thinking, why'd you say that? Cause I just started getting this weird feeling. And I said, why did you, why did you ask about an old lady? And she goes, oh, I saw your, your roommate behind, you know, behind you. She was just like, you know, looked like she was watching what you're typing. I said, what you, you know, I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, what roommate? It, uh, it, well, my roommate was in the house, but, you know, my uh, my, my my door was completely closed. There's no one in there but me, myself. And at this point, I almost start freaking out. My the hair on the back of my neck starts, you know, sticking up, and I'm looking behind me. I'm, I'm seeing nothing. At the time, she sees nothing either, but it, for a moment... She saw someone behind me, and honestly, I really do believe her. She's the sweetest girl there is, and after maybe about 30 minutes or so, she didn't really want to talk about it. That was, that's the thing. After I told her my no one was there, she's like, oh, oh, oh I must have saw something. It well, bothered started, her, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, well, and then I started to ask her a little bit more about it, and then she she actually kind of confessed that sometimes she sees things that other people do not see. Now, the odd thing to me, you know, I've heard of this before, not, you know, to be honest, um, I didn't think it was possible to see it over a webcam. And, um, well, you, would, I you, you would think not, Bill. That's incredible. The last time I talked to you, you gave me advice of, um, you know, possibly researching um, or showing her, um, possible family members, because I, I actually thought in my, if, you know, I was kind of thinking that maybe it was my grandmother or something sure. like that. it's very possible. And and at the time you said, uh, you know, maybe I should show her some a picture of my grandmother. Well, the thing is, actually, she's coming to visit in like a week, and uh, she's, she doesn't really want to deal with it this time. So do at it. this point, you I'm kind of it, keeping though. it quiet. And you're not going to show her the picture? No, I, I, don't, I don't really want to stir things up. I think in a month I'm actually going to start researching on the why, area. And possibly why don't you kind I of live. do this? Why don't you put the picture out kind of like on the table somewhere and see if she comes by and picks it up and looks at it? That's a good idea. Yeah, that way you're not pushing it, but it's there. It's subtle. She may look at it and go, oh, my God, Bill, I know who that is. But do it like that. 
Let's go to our next caller. Let's go to Mountain View, California. Lynn, you're on Coast to Coast and Ghost to Ghost. Hey, Lynn. Hi, George. Happy Halloween. You too. Did you have a good time? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Good. What's your story? My story happened a number of years ago when I was a freshman in college. I was in the photo department, and this was the first night I was printing by myself in the darkroom overnight. Now, darkrooms, I'm sure you know this, but they're not completely dark. They have a safe light. They're either red or orange. Right. And they're also very hot. They usually have bad ventilation, so they have a fan. But after a while, you know, your eyes adjust, so you can see pretty clearly. So... This was the first time I was using large paper, which was expensive. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be extra careful. Focus my print. I put it in the developer. It was completely a blur. There was nothing there. I went back to my enlarger, did it again, made sure it was sharp, put it in the developer, completely blank. I went back to my enlarger the third time. Everything, all of my equipment was turned upside down, moved, stacked on top of each other. I know it seems like a cliche. So I, <laughs> I printed it again, went to the developer, was printing my print. This time it was fine. But out of my periphery, I could see right to my right a black shape, a shape that was transparent but still black. And I thought, okay, it's just my eyes. Then I felt behind me something passing behind me, like that wind that you feel yes. over and over and over again. And I thought, okay, it's just the fan. Then I felt on the back of my neck absolutely that something was pressing against my skin and breathing on my neck with icy breath. And at that moment, I knew just instinctively, somehow knew that I was in the presence of a ghost. I dropped everything. I screamed. I ran into the lobby. And we had a lab monitor that worked, you know, not too late, but he was there for a few hours. And I told him what happened. And he said that he had heard footsteps coming down the hallway many, many nights, and no one ever arrived. So this just fueled my fear. I knew there was something in there. I got my things. I went home. You know, I had projects to do, and I was just terrified to go back in. So the next night, I brought a friend with me. I thought that would protect me. I don't blame you. (laughs) (laughs) We're both printing. And, again, the same sort of antics, you know, passing behind me in repetition, feeling like there's someone on the back of my neck, things moving. And at, at one point, I looked up onto the ceiling, and I saw this black, transparent shape and it was coming in through the door and out through the exit around the ceiling over and over in rapid succession and I said to my friend did you see that and we both saw it and then George this is the freakiest thing we looked over towards the entrance and it materialized into a human shape it was a a blackish brown murky shape and it was only from the legs down like from the waist down it was boots, and it looked like work clothes, maybe from the 19th century. And I could see through it, but it was very, it was still very solid, and then it just disappeared. Gosh, that's a great story, Lynn. Ghost to Ghost continues in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Next Friday, I will be in Las Vegas. We'll be doing the program live out there with reporter Linda Moulton Howe. It is an incredible UFO crash retrieval conference so come on by because we've got a meet and greet there at 6 30 to 8 30 friday november 7 more information on all this in las vegas is at www.ufoconference.com hi i'm joshua p warren and here is my ghost story Of course, a lot of people think about ghostly visions of the past, but you might be surprised to know there are lots of ghostly visions of the future. And this particular event actually played a role in me becoming a paranormal investigator. Uh, On my mother's side of the family, there were some really rough times living here in the mountains of western North Carolina back during the Great Depression. And in the mountains, my grandmother, who was only 12 or 13 years old, was really surprised to get uh, a camera for her birthday. And she started 
snapping shots of everything, as you can imagine. Well, one day her older brother named Claude, who was in his early 20s, and their father, Jack, came back from a small game hunting trip, just rabbits and squirrels and things. And she took a, a photograph of them standing there holding their kill. Well, they were amazed to find that when the picture developed, Claude did not have a head. They thought that was pretty weird, of course, but they didn't know enough about photography to understand just how weird it was, especially since the background was still visible. Well, as it turns out, about one month later, Claude was home with their father, Jack, and Jack was fixing them lunch in the kitchen, and Claude was outside on the porch reading a copy of his favorite magazine called Western Magazine. And they were having a casual conversation back and forth through an open window. And at one point, Claude stopped answering. And so Jack eventually went outside to see where his son had gone and found that there was the copy of Western Magazine sitting there with its its pages, you know, rustling in the breeze, but no Claude. Hours later, other members of the family came home. Still, no trace of Claude. Well, they searched far and wide for days, turning to months, even years. And as the old proverb goes, Claude was never seen nor heard from again. It appeared as though he had absolutely vanished in the blink of an eye. What happened to him? Had he been spirited away or did he get sucked into some other dimension or portal? I don't know, but it captured my imagination. And whatever happened to my great uncle Claude was clearly foretold his fate foretold in a phantom photograph so that is a true story and think about that as you enjoy your investigations this month happy halloween ah none other than joshua p warren let's go to our wild card line charlie you are on ghost to ghost understand you're nine years old charlie huh yeah well hello charlie how are you good so, uh, I um have been seeing my I haven't seen my dead grandpa for a number of months. Oh like yeah. Single times from like a month to two months to three months, month after month, like to four months to five months. And it just keeps on coming to me, and then now, I just. Where do you see him, Charlie? Is he like uh, hanging around, talking to you? No, he just like pops up. Like, I can, like, be in a whole other situation. Like, say, I was playing soccer, and then I could turn around after practice, and I could see him there, like, waving to me. And I'm like, I must be going insane to see this. No, he's probably there, Charlie. Charlie, let me ask you, did you know him when you were a little boy? Was he still alive then? He was still alive then. He died a couple months ago. Okay. He died okay. in about March. And then um, I've been seeing him from now and then. I'm just. And, uh, you know, so, did did you tell your parents and what do they say? They said, well, they just said to kind of like, if you want to let it out, let it out. And if you don't, just don't. Yeah, like, do th- your decision. If you want to let it out to the whole entire world, let it out to the whole entire world. And, and let me no, tell you, no. let me ask you, Charlie, do you, how, do, how do you like the fact that he comes back to visit you? Well, I really appreciate that. That's a real yeah. friendship that's, from God. That's, really, that's kind of neat, Charlie. I really didn't get to see him when I was, uh, he saw me when I was born, like a couple minutes old. But then... Uh, But then I was, I just, I couldn't see him because he lived uh, two states away. And well, you, en- we you enjoy the moment, be- Charlie. Because, you know, one day this is what's going to happen. You're going to grow up. You're going to become a big guy. And he probably won't come around all the time. But he's doing it now because you both need each other. So you enjoy it, okay? Okay. All right, Charlie. 
That's a good little nine-year-old. And by the way, his father gave us permission to talk to him. We always do that. Let's go to Las Vegas, Nevada. Steve, you're on Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Hey, George. Nice to talk to you finally. You too, my friend. What's going on? I'm going to be there Friday. Come on by next week. Yeah, I heard. I'm working at that time. Ah, okay. Uh, I might I might try to take the day off, but I don't ever get to listen to you because I work nights. So I have to listen to you in the daytime on your stream link. Ah, okay, cool. What's your story for us, Steve? Well, about, I guess about four months ago, I come home from work, and, and I usually get home about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I go get in bed with my wife and try to wake her up, but she won't wake up. And I found out the next morning she had taken a sleeping pill because she was, like, having... You know, like an anxiety attack. Oh, no. You couldn't yeah. really breathe or something. So I'm like, okay, let's go to sleep. And I guess I slept for probably about three hours or so. And I started having this dream. And in this dream, I was like in the neighborhood I used to live in when I was a kid. And out of nowhere, this tall blonde guy comes over and starts, he grabs me. And he puts this thing over my face. And... And I, I start having a hard time breathing, and I don't know what happened. Like, like ever since I was a kid, I've been able to. I started like learning how to uh, lucid dream. Uh huh. So somehow I was able to get the better of this guy. I like grew in my dream, you know. And I put the thing over his face, and I started walking away, and I was feeling really like uh, tingly all over. Yeah. And I like fell down, and then I woke up. Well, I'm laying there in bed, you know, just thinking about this dream. I wake up and, like, I look over to the side of the room and, like, this dark shadow comes rising up behind the dresser. And I can see the head and the shoulders. And there's, like, these two red eyes just staring uh, at me. It's coming back after you, Steve. And he's just watching me. I'm like, what the hell? And I'm still feeling tingly, you know? And... I reach over to my wife, you know, from behind me, and I'm, like, patting her butt. I'm, like, telling her, you know, <laughs> you know, trying to wake her up just so she could see if I'm seeing something or if, like, I'm hallucinating or something. But she won't wake up. I'm like, what the hell? You know, and I, I looked at the thing for about a minute, and it looked at me, and I was like, all right, I command you to get out of here, you know, in the name of God. And the thing just, like, sunk back down behind the dresser. And I didn't see it anymore, you know? It's amazing that when you echo those words, they always seem to go away. You think if they were friendly, they'd stay, right? It wouldn't bother them. But when you say God, off they go. Sounded like something demonic. Francis, let's go to you. Where are you calling from, Francis? I'm calling from Everson, Washington. Well, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, George. I've listened to you since you took over for... Um, the show, and, and I really, really look forward to listening to you every day. And thank you for everything that you do. My pleasure. Well, my story happened in Seattle um, probably four or five, probably about five years ago. And it's like nothing I had ever experienced before and and never since. And, and Is it one of those that you hope it never happens again? Uh, absolutely. Um, All right. It, it, it was a fear that I've never experienced, and, and I don't like the feeling of fear, contrary to most people oh, on yeah. Halloween night. <laughs> so a friend of mine, Star, and, uh, and I were going to be flying to Miami for a business conference, and since our flight left really early in the morning, we decided, since we lived two and a half hours from Seattle, that we would drive down and spend the night and take the shuttle over to the airport the next morning. Sure. Yeah, that's So um, we were in bed early and asleep, and um, sometime during the night, I was awakened with some noise outside in the hall, and it sounded like people opening and shutting an ice chest or something and maybe tossing beverages back and forth or something. And and I rolled over on my side and looked at the clock, and it was 2.09 in the morning. And so I closed my eyes, and I thought, oh, how am I ever going to get back to sleep? I'm excited about going to Miami, and now I'm awake, and I have to get up in two hours. And I was just I was really feeling kind of, ticked off that I'd been awakened like that. So I tossed and turned for a while and and ended up back on my right side again. And 
I'm still trying to go to sleep, and, and I rolled over and looked at the clock, and it was only about 2.30, and, and I was laying there, and all of a sudden, um, the room got really, 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 really still, and I got a really loud, shrieky buzzing in my ears. And about the same time that that happened, um, an arm went around from the back of me, went around my chest, um, and kind of tucked under the arm that was laying against the bed. And I was pinned down. And there was, an, and I felt the other arm was across my back, and I was just totally and completely pinned down. And I was just full of total and complete instant fear. Even as I talk about it now, I still feel a lot of that emotion come up. Francis, was there a moment where you thought somebody had broken in? Absolutely. I thought there was somebody in the room, and I, as I laid there with my mind racing, I was pretty sure that the Seattle papers the next morning were going to be reporting a woman had been killed in in a... Oh, gosh. I, I I was sure that I was facing imminent death. And my heart, instead of racing, felt like it it had almost stopped beating. And my, you know how when you get startled, your stomach kind of falls to your knees? Uh I had that that feeling and it wouldn't go away. And so as my mind was racing, I knew this person was was strong. He had me pinned, pinned down and I knew that I couldn't fight against him. I wasn't strong enough. And I knew I had to use my mind. And so... I was racing, what can I do, what can I do? Well, I had been actually, you had been having programs on not too long before that about people communicating long distance with each other. And I think there had been some Heart Math Institute information Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm going to communicate with this person. And so I started sending him thoughts and saying, you don't need to do this. Um, you can get up and walk out of the room. Nobody's going to know you're here. Man, you became proactive in this thing. Well, there wasn't anything else I could do, and thankfully, that's what dropped into my mind at that point. Well, nothing was happening. I thought he was still holding me as tightly as he had been, and 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 and, uh, and it dropped into my mind. Okay, just. Send him love, just send him love. And I believe that our minds consciously communicate with each other and unconsciously or subconsciously communicate with each other too. So during this process of sending him love and light, um, the pressure started to lessen on my arm. That's incredible. And But I could still feel the arm on the back of my back. And what at what point were you saying... There's nobody in here. I wasn't there yet at all. No, so you still thought maybe someone was there. I still was thought that there was somebody sitting or, or yeah, somehow exactly. right there. And um, so almost within a few minutes, the arm totally, the, the arm that was on the back of my back left. The pressure was gone. But still you're thinking, there's someone in the room. Absolutely, and I yeah. laid there, and I could see stars outlined in her bed. And I could hear her breathing, and I thought, I've got to tune my breathing to her breathing and pretend like I'm still asleep. Um, because it didn't seem like he was doing anything further negative towards me as long as I was, he thought I was asleep. And as I did that, I listened really, really carefully for footsteps or shuffling or a door or something, and I couldn't hear anything at all. So after about five or more minutes, I decided, well... I can't just lay here paralyzed all night. I've got to do something. I thought, okay, it's not really unusual for somebody um, to stretch and wake up during the middle of the night and and shuffle around. So I started kind of stirring a little bit and stretched. And as I stretched out, I reached for the nightstand and was thankfully instantly able to pick up my cell phone and continue to stretch. And I stood up and I shuffled around and my, my thought was, okay. Still I, thinking somebody was oh, in there. absolutely. What a nightmare. So I am shuffling to the bathroom and I'm thinking, okay, so I remember putting this, that special latch on the door that hotels have so nobody can really get in. Right, right. It's almost, it's not quite a deadbolt, but it's close. Yeah, it's, and yeah. so I'm, 
and it's something that you can see. I mean, you physically move that latch. Yeah, over you flip door. it over. Exactly. Yeah. So I thought, okay, so when I get to the bathroom, I'm going to latch the bathroom, and I'm going to lock the bathroom door. I'm going to turn on the light, and I'm going to shut the door at the same time, and I'm going to look at that latch on the door because the bathroom door and the door to our hotel room inside were right next to each other. And as I did that, the thought's going to through my mind, we're on the third floor. And at the same time, I'm seeing the latch. It's still latched. And at that same time, all, all just boom, 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 star set straight up in bed and just <gasps> was just this gasp inward as she sat straight up in bed. And she had, um, had begun having seizures not too long before that, and I thought she was going into a seizure. Oh, my God. And I had... In the meantime, somehow, I don't know at what point, um, I had gotten a hanger and I had a, a flimsy hanger in my hand and I went running out of the bathroom because... Star, you were going you, you were going to attack this thing? I, well... I the was, hanger? Uh, well, my, my friend, who is as close to me as a daughter could ever be, is now in danger. And so all thought of my own danger left my mind. And I went running out there and... There was nobody in the room. And you looked everywhere. Oh, I looked in every nook and cranny where even nobody could possibly be hiding, and there was nobody in the room. So Star and I sat up the rest of the night. It was 3 o'clock in the morning by this time. And so we sat up the next um, until 4 o'clock talking about what it just, what it had, had occurred. I'll tell you what, it, it, it is one of those things when you wake up and you feel that and you can't see and you actually think somebody has broken into your room to do these things. Poor uh, television anchor woman was killed, bludgeoned to death in her house and stabbed um, last week. Um, horrible situation. That has got to be petrifying, absolutely petrifying. Hey, by the way, just a little note. The week of November 16th, starting Sunday, 11 p.m. Pacific time, 11 p.m. Eastern time. Five nights, our sci-fi show called The Unexplained. Please watch it if you get a moment or TiVo it. And uh, on the West Coast, of course, the live Coast to Coast show will be underway. So bring the television in by your radio or vice versa and watch both. The show, the television show, is only 30 minutes long. It goes by very quickly. And if it's successful in the ratings, well, we'll be on five nights a week. Not bad. We'll be back in a moment. Ghost to Ghost continues on Coast to Coast AM. Indeed, welcome to Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast AM. You know, this is the kind of night after the couple of months we've been having with this economic calamity everybody's in just to kind of sit back for a change and chill and it's kind of nice today at least here in st louis to see people with their costumes on doing what they do and having a lot of fun but again go up to the coast to com website click the digicam icon that you'll see there take a look at producer tom who is wearing a mask that i bought from the company that made that fraudulent Bigfoot costume. It's a great costume. They didn't know it was going to be used for that purpose. But go take a look at what I bought. Tommy's in costume there at coasttocoastam.com. This is John DeSalvo, and do I have a ghost story for you? This is actually a true story that happened to a very close friend of mine. Her name is Judy. She is a retired newspaper editor, and most of her life she had the gift of being psychic. And this story took place in 1979. Um, there was this couple who Judy knew whose husband was a skeptic and did not really believe in the supernatural or Judy's psychic ability. Then one night, about 2 in the morning, Judy's phone rings. At the other end is that skeptical husband, and he sounds frantic. Judy says, calm down, tell me what happened. He said that he and his wife were sleeping, and they were awakened by the sound of music. They followed the sound to the children's room. They had a boy and a girl who shared a bedroom. The children were sitting up in bed with a frightened and almost paralyzed look on them, staring into the open closet in their bedroom. The music was coming from the closet. As the father approached the closet, he saw that the music was coming 
from an old 1950 Emerson radio, which was being stored there. The only unusual thing about it was that the radio was not plugged in. The father got the children out of the room as fast as he could and then called Judy. When Judy arrived, the husband was trembling and pointed to something near the door. It was a crucifix. He said that there was a bottle of holy water that was attached to the crucifix stand, and it is completely gone. He had previously found it missing when he went to get it to sprinkle it in the children's bedroom. No idea what happened. Judy touched the crucifix and felt a presence, which was very angry, frustrated, and deeply saddened. It was a woman. So they led Judy to the children's room, and as they passed from one room to the other, the lights flickered. When they got to the children's room, Judy looked into the closet, and the Emerson radio was still playing, unplugged. Then something caught Judy's eye. Right next to the radio was a bottle of holy water. Judy then remembered that the wife's mother had just passed away. The old Emerson radio belonged to her. And the wife told Judy that she and her sister had been fighting over the deceased mother's possessions, and there had been much anger and frustration in the family. Judy knew that the spirit presence was the mother, and she was the cause of this disturbance. The mother was not happy with what was going on, and Judy felt that the deceased mother wanted the sisters to work this out in love. The wife agreed, and at this moment, the disturbance stopped. Now, when everything calmed down, Judy asked the children if they had seen their grandmother since she had gone to be with God. And the girl said their grandma came to see them at night when her mommy and daddy were sleeping to let them know how much she loved them. The boy said that when the radio was playing, it was really neat because he didn't have to have it plugged in. But he wanted to hear some other kind of music than the 50s music that it had been playing. <laughs> so I really like this story since it shows that love within a family survives even after death. And I would like to wish the Ghost to Ghost audience a happy and scary Halloween night. That's a great story, John. Let's go to the phones now. We'll go to Jeff in Indianapolis. You're up with us. Hey, Jeffrey, thanks for holding. Hey, how are you doing? Happy Good. Halloween. You too, my friend. Just to let you know that our son in 2003 was on your website with his birth announcement for Halloween. Cool. <laughs> yeah. He was dressed up as, not dressed as an alien, but uh, I photo touched him to be an alien. <laughs> and now he's five years old, huh? Now he's five, and he still carries the picture around with him and tells everybody it's him. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, my story starts on the south side of Indianapolis. Um, we lived in a house. Actually, we bought the house from my aunt and uncle. And uh, when we had lived there, she had passed away in 72 okay. from cancer in the house. Uh. And I had always been, as, as maybe a teenager, my bedroom was always... The head of my bed would be facing the bathroom, and my stereo would be on the other side. It'd be, it was a silver stereo, so there would always be a reflection. And then I would wake at 4 o'clock in the morning and hear my dad saying, get away from the door. Get away from the door. He'd be in the bathroom getting ready, and every morning I'd be like, what's he talking about, you know, <laughs> yeah, with nobody yeah. there? And um, finally it came out one year we went to a family function, and my mom, who was definitely a non-believer, finally just opened up and told the whole story that um, they used to play cards, and up and down the stairs they would hear feet steps going up, but never down. Hmm. And they would hear things going on in other rooms. My dad was a, he liked to drink a little bit, yeah. And if he would come home late at night, then all the doors in the house would be open and the lights would be on. And then my mother used to say that she would put her feet down at the end of the bed to keep her feet warm because that's where my aunt sat. <laughs> then my brother had a girlfriend and the basement seemed to be the hot spot. And one night she came up as white as a ghost and said that she had seen a woman in a bathrobe with curlers in her hair sitting on the edge of the couch while she was alone. That's the and end. She would, and she would never come back to the house again. And my mom had finally told us that she had went down there and saw my aunt sitting on the end of the couch when she did laundry. And she would just 
look at her and she'd say, hi, Glenda, how are you doing? <laughs> go in and do her laundry, go back upstairs. And would the and apparition notice her? Would it Would it yes. kind of look at her? Jeez. It turned her head and looked right at her. With my mom, my mom basically being a non-believer, it was just kind of amazing the way she interacted with it. <laughs> well, she was and a believer then. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Let's take a few more here. Ellen, you're on Coast to Coast. Hi, Ellen. Hello. Hi. Where are you calling from, Ellen? I'm calling from Arizona. Okay, go ahead. Well, um, this is a story that happened to me about 16 years ago. 16? I, okay. Yes, and I lived in a uh, about a 100-year-old Victorian house on, uh, that was quite isolated. Oh, I can see it coming now. <laughs> <laughs> it was on top of a hill. And uh, not too much around it, uh, an old warehouse across the, the street. The house on the haunted hill, huh? It was a haunted hill, or still is to this day. And um, I lived there with a roommate, but um, on this particular night, I was home um, alone. And um, most nights, uh, very strangely, I'd awaken about uh, 2 o'clock or a little after 2 o'clock. And um, I woke up on this particular evening... And um, I could hear these strange noises um, from the furthest end of the house. It, um, it sounded as, as though somebody was running around in the house, um, but not like a real person, sort of very, very rapid uh, footsteps running from one room to another. Um, started off in the kitchen. Did it, did it sound like animal sounds or a little person, maybe? Just a small person running around. Small, okay. Yeah. And... Um, and ran from the kitchen to the dining room and back again a few times. And um, I was just sort of lying there listening to this, and it, uh, it kept running from the dining room, dining room then to the living room. Constant, pitter-patter, back and yes, forth. Yes, back and forth a few times. And then um, the noise continued, and uh, it went from the living room to the uh, second bedroom, which is uh, also off the living room. And uh, I was just sort of lying there listening and uh, didn't quite know what to think. I started getting a little um, afraid. And uh, and I could hear this thing running around. And it went um, into the second bedroom and then uh, ran through an adjoining bathroom and um, <clears throat> washed right into bed with me. And it was just right next to me. <laughs> and and, and the, did the pitter-pattering stop after that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it did. I could hear something, you know, and it just came through the, the bathroom from the other bedroom, and uh, and um, I was facing away from the door, and uh, I, I was I was so afraid. I just sort of laid there, and um, I didn't do anything, and so it finally went away. And I, I'm not quite sure how long that took in retrospect, but um, that must be weird, Ellen, to hear <laughs> that. You know, that constant pitter pattering. It was quite strange. My gosh. Hey, thanks for the story. Next, let's go to Orland in California, west of the Rockies. Orland, take it away. Yeah, how you doing, George? Good. Thanks. This story, a uh, little set up there. Uh, my, my father's co-worker told this story in 1947. and uh, We're talking about a 61-year-old story here, huh? Yes, yeah. Uh, he, when he was in this, the setting is in uh, southern Missouri, 1917, when Hap McGill was, all of the principals are dead. But uh, Hap was in the habit of uh, saddling up his pony and riding to the local watering hole and cavorting with the ladies of the evening and riding home with a snoot full. And as he rode past the pasture there, why, he would see this white thing this white apparition follow along just inside the fence. And it scared him, so he would ride fast, and this white thing would pace him. Keep right up with him. Keep right up with him. He'd slow down, and that white thing would slow down. And this happened on consecutive weekends. And every Saturday night or Sunday, early Sunday morning when half would ride home, why this white thing out in the pasture there would pace him. And he thought, sure, he was a ghost, and it scared the hell out of him. So Hap decided that uh, <clears throat> he'd load up his 4440 and uh, uh, 
have it out. So the following uh, Sunday morning when he rode home, why, here it was. It just followed him right along, just at whatever pace he spent. And uh, so he emptied his 44 at it and then rode like hell home and went to bed. And the next morning, why, he, after he sobered up, why, he went out to pasture there to see if maybe he shot something. And he found his father's pedigreed white-faced bull just deader than hell. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> better better make sure of your target when you start shooting. Absolutely. Orlin, that is a classic. Let's go. <laughs> Mark in Greenwood, Indiana, east of the Rockies. Hey, Mark, go ahead. Okay. Uh, a couple months ago, a friend of mine that I knew... Um, she had told her neighbors that lived behind her that I had a tendency to pick up on people. And she said, okay, I got a good one for you. If you can pick up on somebody in particular, you're better than anybody I've ever met. So I sit on a picnic table, and I was in my gym shorts and a tank to, well, shirt, and uh -huh. like a T-shirt. And we were talking, and all of a sudden it felt like someone had whispered in my ear, then all of a sudden, it felt like someone was tugging on my shirt. So I thought, okay, I've lost it. And I, out of the corner of my eye, it looked like someone was sitting next to me. And I looked again, and all of a sudden, it vanished. And this lady I was talking to, her chin dropped. Like, I thought, okay, someone must have been sitting there. I said, it was an older gentleman. There was an old uniform, like an Army uniform. She said, yeah, my grandfather was in the Army. If you could tell me who, where, what branch she was in, no one knows except for the media family. And all of a sudden, he came back and whispered in my ear, paratrooper. Oh, man. And I said, he was a paratrooper in World War II. She, oh. Oh, she started shaking, and she started crying. She said, no one knew that. I know she couldn't have told you because no one knew about it except for the media family. And she said, how'd you know? I said, he was on top secret stuff, and he was not to tell anybody. Oh, my God. Oh, get away from me. I said, oh, by the way, he tells me your husband's got a scar inside of his left arm. She said, no, he don't. I've been married to him for over 20 years. I know him. I said, <laughs> ask him. I don't know what her husband looks like. He came out, and she said, honey, do you have a scar? He said, yeah. She where? He said, underneath my left arm right next to my rib cage. Unbelievable. And she looked at me. I said, was there someone there? She said, my grandfather liked to tug on people's shirt sleeves when he wanted to get their attention. And I seen him sitting next to you. Are you that good, Mark? All the time? I don't know. I, I get them from time to time. And come to find out where this place is, where they live, used to be an Indian burial ground. Was she a believer in you after all this? And she looked at me, and she kind of backed up. She said, I don't understand. And I said, neither do I. And then she had told her mother, and her mother was kind of a non-believer. She said, it's an act of the devil. Stay away from him. And I said, okay, fine, no problem. Ah, oh, an act of the devil. No. Anita in Mackey, Indiana. Hey, Anita, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. What's your story? Well, first of all, I have to tell you, my husband and my son are sitting in the truck listening to you so that I don't mess up the interference. And my husband <laughs> is a big, big, big fan of yours, so I told him I would promise to say that. He's been listening to Art Bell for years and is a fan of yours. And I have fallen asleep at many a times trying to go to work the next morning and woke up with nightmares from listening. <laughs> well, thanks to all of you. We appreciate it. <laughs> But tonight we're listening. This is our big night that we like to listen. And um, I was kind of joking earlier saying I should tell my story, and I didn't think they would tell me, but my son and my husband both said I should call and tell you my story. So um, the house that I grew up in. Uh, when Which I, was uh, in, lived, in Indiana? It's in Indiana. We live in uh, Mackey, Indiana. We live about, the house I grew up in is about 15 uh, city, a little town about 15 miles away from here. And uh, moved there when I was about three years old. Whole time I lived there, you know, uh, I come from a big family. There's ten kids in our family. I'm the youngest. When we moved in that house, I was three years old. There was about five kids 
that still lived at home. And we had bedrooms down in the basement where we all, we had two beds, three girls in one and two girls in another bed. We had a kitchen, that type of thing. (laughs) But we had one brother that had an upstairs bedroom upstairs. He was away at college, but the bedroom set upstairs just in case for when he came home. (laughs) But we all got to stay down in the basement. (laughs) But the story is, is that we had, that's where we kind of had our kitchen. That's where we cooked at and everything. But. As I grew up, and of course, as the other kids grew up, we more moved up to the upstairs, but I always had this feeling. I didn't have it coming down the stairs, but going up the stairs as a little girl, I always had this, and I still have it right now. I just can feel it, but whenever I go up the stairs, there was just this tingly feeling that there was always somebody behind you. I just always had this feeling. So um, as we grew up and stuff, things, you know, things happen. And at one time, I had heard a story about my brother that had lived, that was in college, and when he would come home on the weekends, that he had uh, went to the basement. We had a full bath down there also. And you hold it right there, Anita, because we're going to take this break and come right back to you, where you can pick it right up on Ghost to Ghost. Hello, this is Lionel Fanthorpe. Let me tell you about the vampires of Haydn, a village on the Hungarian. A young Austrian soldier named Joachim Hubner was stationed with a local farmer and his family. They were getting on very well. One night, after their evening meal, the ladies were in the kitchen. The farmer, his teenage son, and young Joachim Hubner were having a drink together. The farmer was standing so that he could see the open door behind the two younger men. Suddenly, in mid-sentence, his face turned white and a look of horror spread over it. The boy and Joachim, the soldier, turned and looked in the same direction. An old man was entering the room through the open door of the farmhouse. He walked slowly towards the farmer touched him on the shoulder then turned away out through the door and disappeared into the gathering shadows of the evening the farmer staggered upstairs as though he had aged 40 years in as many seconds his son and the ladies followed him desperate with anxiety. He died during the night. Joachim asked who the old man was and whether his visit could have had anything to do with the farmer's death. Yes, said the teenage lad. That old man was my grandfather and he has been in his grave for ten years. When the story became known, the Count of Cadreras was sent to investigate. The grandfather's corpse was exhumed, and despite being buried for ten years, the body looked as if it had died that day. It was staked through the heart, decapitated, and reinterred. The Cadreras manuscript that tells the story is in the library of the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. Beyond the Grave Indeed. First of all, shout-out time. Those of you listening to Ghost to Ghost right now at your favorite radio stations across North America, thank you for what you do. Streamlink members, of course, I tip my hat to you, but I'm not wearing a hat. And those of you who listen to us on XM as well. And then the various chat rooms. The folks at the nighthawkzone.com, boy, are they hooping it up there tonight. Having a great time. Imaginative World, Sorcery IRC, Into Infinity, Frog Forum, National Radio Club. New website out there, ghost2ghost.org, folks. Having a great time in the Los Angeles area, recording EVPs for more than 10 years. Hello to all of you as well. Now let's go to Anita in Indiana, who's been on hold, and I don't want her to wait. Go ahead, Anita. So all of you were kids. You're sleeping in the same room, in the same bed, and people hear footsteps. You hear footsteps. Go ahead. Well, 
I didn't when I was little. But okay. I, well, as, the older I get, I don't know if it's one of those things, but I just always felt this creepy feeling when I would go up the stairs. And I had heard a story once that my brother, that would always come home from college, he was home alone one time, and he was down in the basement taking a shower. His friend was supposed to come pick him up or something. And he kept thinking he heard somebody hollering, like, hello or whatever. Uh-huh. And he kept saying, I'm down here. I'm down here. Well, nobody would... He, he never could, nobody would come down there where he was at. So he went up. There was nobody in the house. The house was empty. Um, his friend finally showed up. He said, where were you at? You know, I thought you were here. And he said, I have not been here. So this was the first little inkling that something had happened and everything. So I always thought whenever I had these creepy feelings when I was growing up, well, I had heard this story. So that's probably what it it was just a scary story, and that probably was what was bothering me. But it always, I, I couldn't, like, I didn't like being in that basement by myself. Well, then when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I was home alone in the house, been there for a couple hours, cleaning, doing, you know, chores that my parents had told me to do. And we had a dining room area we have in the house. It, when you walk in the back door, there's a kitchen, a dining room area, and a living room area, all kind of like open. So if you sit in the living room, you could sit at the end of the uh, or in the dining room, sit at the end of the dining room table, you could watch TV or whatever. Right, you could my see dad, right through. Yeah, and my dad, of course, he was the head of the table. He was always right there on the end, and he had been sitting there earlier that day. And his chair, when he left. Just like you would do, you were sitting at a table, you would just push out, get up and walk away. He never pushed the chair up. Well, I'm on the phone with one of my girlfriends, and she's doing this, oh, come over. And I'm like, no, my mom and dad's going to be home soon. I, I need to stay where I'm at, whatever. And we're just doing a stupid teenage girl talking stuff. And I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, there's nobody in the house. I am sitting one end of the table, and the chair where my dad's chair is pulled out. Just it, it just looked like somebody had walked by. You couldn't see a person, but it was like the chair was in its way, and it just pushed right up to the table <laughs> by itself. I was 13, you know, young teenager. I was on the phone with my girlfriend. I said, I'll be there in five minutes. She lived all the way across town. We live in a little bitty town, granted, but... I was there in less than five minutes, and she was like, I got on my bicycle, and I never pedaled so fast in my yeah. whole life. I'm feet, telling you. feet don't I fail don't. me now. Thanks, Anita. And we'll be back in a moment on Ghost to Ghost on Coast to Coast AM. Ah, nothing like Lionel Fanthorpe. Mike, let's go to you on our wild card line. Welcome to Ghost to Ghost, Mike on Coast to Coast. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, George. What a wonderful Halloween. What a wonderful show. Well, um, thank you. Beef. Uh, my story here is, is about a man named uh, a, a fine American by the name of Frank Zamora, whose spirit recently departed his earthly body and moved down to the great beyond. Uh. Frank was 77 years old when he passed on. He was a veteran. He served his country in the Navy as a chief petty officer for 25 years. He was blessed to have been married to his the love of his life for 48 years. He and his wife, Mary, had raised two children and a few others that weren't their own, my wife included, my wife's best friend of his daughter. Um, Mary, his wife, had passed away about three years ago. Okay. So Frank had took the loss pretty hard, of course. And, um, you know, eventually... Over time, he sold the house and, and moved down to San Diego to be close to his daughter, Patty, and his son-in-law, Mark, along with their their children, Corey and Kyle. Well, the last year or so, his health started failing due to some intestinal and colon and kidney infections. And the last few months, he'd had some operations and relapses and hmm. Kept him, it, it, it kept him in the hospital down there, Navy Hospital. So he had been put on life support and feeding tube and was in quite quite a bit of pain. And a few weeks ago, he had made the decision that, you know, it was time, no more life support, it was time to go. Well, at about 8 o'clock uh, one morning, uh, Patty and Mark really felt that this was it. So they started calling friends and family and let them know that if 
you know, if they wanted to see Frank one last time, now was the time to do it. So for the for the rest of the morning, uh, he was visited by family and friends and the numerous amount of orderlies that he had befriended while he was in the hospital. They all loved him, did they, Mike? Oh, yeah. I mean, Chief Petty Officers, you know, as a Navy man, that, oh, you yeah. know, you get a good Chief Petty Officer you love. And Frank was a great guy. They're I knew gold. About, yeah, they're gold. That's it. I, I knew him about 23 years of the amount of time I've been married to my wife, and I, I like the guy instantly. Um, the previous night had been really rough for him, and, uh, you know, he was in a lot of pain at this point. And about 12.10... His, his breathing became heavier, and he was becoming real anxious. And he tried to put his arm around his daughter, Patty, and, and she had looked at him and, and uh, told him that soon he'd be with his, his wife. And uh, then a change came over him that was he was so much calmer and relaxed than he had been up to this point. According to Mark, the, he's, Mark says the room even got brighter at that point and that's when he kind of you know said made the comment that mom's coming you know mark had said uh, this and you know just a feel it was a feeling he had he says he goes your mom's coming and he had looked at frank and then he turned back to patty and said mom's here and he looked back at frank and frank was kind of looking up and smiling and then he he kind of pursed his lips as as to kiss someone, and then his his lips kind of went relaxed, and the room darkened again, and he was gone. What a what a heartwarming story, though, Michael. Well, you know, the one thing that Mark had told me after the viewing, and he had told me this story, was that the whole time Mark never shed a tear, and, and Mark loved Frank, and he said he never shed shed a tear because he said it was just so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, he said it, was that, a, it was a happy way to see this happen. It was supposed to happen that way, and that's what he, he felt. And it, it was kind of funny because earlier they were talking, and his wife had said something about her Uncle Fred had passed away on October 4th, which was just before that date. And she said, wouldn't it be strange if he passed away the same day? And Mark said, no, there's no way Fred would ever let anybody upstage him on his, you know, the day he died. And Frank was such a prankster and everything. Well, Mark had said he'd gone into the bathroom to wash his hands. And it was one of those that has an automatic infrared, senses your hands under the faucet and turns on. He put his hands underneath the faucet, and the water came out. So he put his hands underneath the soap dispenser. The soap came out. So he turned to the towel rack, put his hand over there, and all of a sudden the water came on. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes... This is getting too weird. And as he stepped out the door, the water came back on again. And he just looked at his wife and he says, Fred's here. Yep. Practical joker. Thanks, Mike. Oh, thank you, George. You have a nice evening. That's a great story. It really is. Let's go next to Linda in Reno, Nevada. Hey, Linda, thanks for holding almost an hour, huh? Almost an hour. Well, I here love you it. are. Just absolutely fabulous. I how was your, so much. How was your Halloween? Did you go out today? Well, um, we got a little bit of uh, rain, snow, kind of sleet thing, and not too many kids. And no, I didn't go out. All right. No costume <laughs> no. for you this year, huh? No, not for me. All right. <laughs> no. All right. What's the I'm story? Working. Um, my story is just kind of um, weird, but can I say one thing really fast? Yeah. I want to thank you, and I want to um, thank all of our people who are serving in the military. And I want to tell them that Love. my heart and my soul is with them. Good for you. Okay. Um, last week, we went up to um, my son and my daughter, went up to Lake Tahoe, and I wanted to show them um, uh, Cal Neva which is the um, casino right on the border of um, California and Nevada that Frank Sinatra used to own. And Good that's old where, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where he used to, um, uh, Marilyn Monroe and the Rat Pack and the Kennedys, ever, um, that, that's just, you know, you walk into that place and you go, whoa. Well, I took my son up there and I didn't warn him. 
before I took him up there that uh-huh. um, he was going to encounter because um, he's very psychic and he um, pulls in a lot of energy. And he's heading towards Marilyn's cabin. She has this, um, has, does, current, has this cabin um, uh, overlooking the lake. That's where her, she still is. Uh, that was her favorite place on earth. And I was like, uh, Robert, don't do that. And before I could catch him, he um, went directly to the front of the cabin, which has a balcony. And I thought, oh, my gosh, no, that's not good. He turned around within five seconds, and he walked back. And his face was white, and he had this, like, um, I don't know, it looked, it was like almost like a teardrop on his cheek. And I said, she touched you. And I said, oh, my gosh. Okay, this is going to be interesting. So I'm taking, I'm taking pictures of them up there, and they're, um, both of them are very connected with um, Marilyn Monroe and very, they have been all their life. They're just, and I'm, I'm watching him, and I see on his cheek, the um, mark where she touched him, he's got this scratch. And first it was a welt, and then it was a scratch. And then I was like, okay, you're just like bleeding just a tiny bit. And he he said, you should have told me. And I said, "I, I, you know what, I didn't know. I didn't know that you were gonna connect that way. I should have known. But I didn't know. And he just, you know, the the way that I have pictures. You can't believe these pictures. you got to get us some of these, Linda. I can. I can. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh, my gosh, this is unreal. And we, we, when we were inside the casino, I'm trying to take pictures. And I have brand new batteries in my camera. And um, Abby and... And Robert are standing um, in the ballroom, and there's a line where um, Nevada and, and California, it's built right on the border. Right, and, okay. Okay, so Frank's office is in California because he couldn't have a gaming license in Nevada. So there are all these underground t- tunnels and all of this. And I'm trying to take pictures, and my camera keeps just like, it won't. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. When we played back the from the um, the disc in the camera, right? It was taking video. Video? Did you hit the wrong button? Because some cameras no. do that. No. I no. don't know how Frank liked films. It was taking video. So would this happen with anybody who goes up there? I I was when. The first time I was up there, I, I got a really, really um, powerful sense. We went into the um, the theater where um, they filmed The Godfather and all of that. Sure. But, I mean, is it you or is it the spot that's doing this? Uh, the spot is very, very... It is. Uh, oh, my gosh. Um, that's yeah. Hey, Linda, we've got to get up to uh, the top of the hour here. But, uh, neat story. I'd love to get up that way. I'll be back in a moment as Ghost to Ghost continues. My gosh, it's going by quickly. Man, I can't believe how fast this night is going. Another hour to go here of Ghost to Ghost, so get ready with your calls. We'll be right back. It's Fiona Horn, your friendly witch, and this is my ghost story. Four years ago, I moved to Housestead, a big mansion in the Hollywood Hills. Now, although it was so big, I was never scared. I was living there alone, but I always felt very safe. I wasn't even scared one night when I was watching TV, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man standing on the staircase looking at me. He had a white dinner jacket on, dark hair parted low across his forehead. But I wasn't scared. He just watched me. I watched TV, and that was that. After that, I continued to see him more frequently around the house. 
and it was unusual. And I was talking to a neighbour about who'd, who'd actually lived in the area quite some time, and I said, do you know anything about the history of the mansion that I'm looking after? And he told me that he knew a lot about it, that it was actually built by an actor named George Montgomery in the late 60s. And George was famous for a lot of Western movies and things, and his time was married to Dinah Shaw. He built the house with his own bare hands. He loved the house. And he even made the house available to Roman Polanski. When Roman Polanski, the famous director, was making Chinatown in the early 70s, he lived there and Faye Dunaway and Jack Nicholson used to party there. The house has an amazing history. So my friend, my neighbour, showed me a book that he had as we were finishing the evening and he said, take a look at this. And it was a book about George's life. And I was flicking through the pages, looking at the photographs, and one stood out. And it was a photograph of a man in a white dinner jacket with dark hair parted low across his forehead. And I knew it was George, my man, my ghostly companion, was George Montgomery, who had passed away about, probably about five years before I moved into the house. So after that, I continued to see George around the house, and we always had a pleasant kind of connection. I always felt safe, even when I was alone there late at night, until the time that I decided to move out. It was time to move on. And I gradually was packing up my things over a week, but I sensed a different energy in the house. I didn't see George. I just felt this dark presence. And it was my final night at the house. And I was laying in bed. I, I fell asleep early. I fell into a very deep sleep. And then I just, at about 5 a.m., sat bolt upright, wide awake. There was someone in the house. I could hear banging and like someone was hitting the walls above me. It was a two-story house. My bedroom was on the lower level and someone was hitting the walls and it was furniture moving around and it was loud. And I was like, oh my gosh, there is an intruder in the house. I've got to call the police. But then I got really scared and I thought, what if I call the police and they see that I'm picking up the phone and they hear me and they'll come down. And I was so terrified, frozen, sitting there. Ten minutes of this noise of people, of someone banging and hitting things. And then it occurred to me, I... And I spoke out aloud and I said, George, I'm sorry I'm leaving. I'll miss you. And there was silence, complete silence. And so it was George letting me know that he didn't want me to go. And I did have to move out of the house. My time there looking after it was done. But um, funnily enough, I, I'm not that far away from George. I moved into another home two doors down from in another Hollywood Hills mansion. And I, very unusual circumstances as to how that happened and very much good fortune. But I think George had a hand in it. I think he wanted to keep me around. And that's my ghost story. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Fiona Hort. By the way, Fiona will be one of our guests during the sci-fi show during the week of November 16th. Let's go on now, Tim in Los Angeles. You're on Ghost to Ghost, Timothy. Happy Halloween, Mr. President. Well, hello there, Ambassador. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine thinking. How are you, sir? This is our running joke in case someone's trying to figure out what are we talking about. <laughs> well, it's not a joke when I'm talking about this. Well, Mr. that's President. true. Yeah. That's true. You never know. Um, the story I want to talk to you about is, it's not really a spooky or evil or bad story. What happened was that I was at my friend's garage. He does smog testing, smog check. Like a uh, yeah, that's store. right. You got to do that in California. Right. So I was sitting down at the table, I mean, at his desk and then, you know, playing with his, you know, his computer, his laptop. When I saw from, when I was, I was looking down, I saw this man walking towards me. I left up, and he was pulling a a suitcase. I looked at him, and he said, oh, I said, hi, how you doing? He goes, well, I'm doing all right. You're kind of tired. And then he said that, um, I sort of mumbled that, yeah, this used to be, um, I forgot what he said. I guess it used to be a bar or something, because that, yeah, this place used to be, bar or whatever and i said well it's a test only place now and he goes yeah and i looked at him and he was like well i gotta go and i said okay take care sir then i looked down and he was walking out i was making sure that he was in he was leaving because i don't want yeah. to get hurt because there's yeah. stuff all over the place so he went around went out the garage made a left then i said oh my god i look like mr alvarado so i looked up put the computer down <laughs> Round off the garage, made a left because he was walking slowly. He was trudging, you know. He was walking, you know, slowly. 
It's still there. You can still see him. Yeah. And I went around the corner and then stopped the garage. He was gone. Mr. Alvarado died about a year ago. Oh, my. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I checked, you know, I walked, went down the block for a little bit to make sure that you know, he didn't go inside, you know, like businesses or whatever, but the, the businesses were closed. That's weird, Tim. And it was like, he looked, seemed kind of sad, kind of tired. And I was kind of bummed out, too, because I just didn't think much about it. But it, it came to me that it was Mr. Alvarado. Cause knowing, you like had, knowing you, you would have talked to him if you were able to catch up with him again, had he still been around there. Oh, most definitely, because I wanted to talk to him and see how he was doing. Because he treated me like a son. He would open up his home, his wife and his kids, because his kids and I were, were co- our co- college friends. And I'll say, hey, stay for dinner. Okay. And you might have you might have brought us a real ghost to put on the show. Darn. I would have, definitely. <laughs> All right, Timothy, have a good weekend. Thank you, you too, Mr. President. Bye-bye. Let's go to West of the Rockies. Joanna, what's your story? Hi, George. Hi. Um, uh, my family and I moved to um, Hope Mills, North Carolina, into a home. It wasn't an old spooky home or anything like that. Um, and everything seemed fine when we first moved in other than um, our golden retriever would not come into my bedroom. Uh-huh. And he had always slept with me since he was a puppy. I, I got him when he was around eight weeks old. Oh, that's adorable. Those, yeah, those and, but he would not come into my bedroom. He would come as far as my door, and he would stand there and whimper and whine, wag his tail, but he wouldn't come in. It was like, I want to come in, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, used to it. But I'm not coming in. Right. And, and a few times I would grab him by the collar and try to pull him in and tell him, you know, it's okay. Come on in. And, and he, as soon as I let go, he would turn around and, and fly like a rocket out of the room. He just would not stay in there. Um, one time in particular, I remember he actually did come in, but he was low to the ground, kind of like belly crawling into the room, did not stay long and took off again. It was like he really wanted to be in there with me, but he just couldn't be in that room. And... So my ex-husband was a truck driver, and me and the children were alone quite often. And so I used to leave the hall light on for my little girl. She was about five at the time. Oh, sure. Yeah. And um, she would, you know, get a, have a nightmare or whatever and want to come sleep with me. So I would leave my hall light on. Well, one night I woke up, and I thought I saw her standing there in the doorway, um, and she looked sad. And I thought, well, she's had a bad dream. So I pulled the covers back, patted the bed. She smiled, and... And came and got in bed, and, and if I maybe had been fully awake or something, I would have realized I didn't actually feel her get into the bed. But um, the next morning I woke up, and I started to roll over. I felt her laying against my back, and I, re- I remembered her getting in bed with me. Or, and and um, so I just sat up. To, you know, I didn't want to roll over on top of her. So I sat up, and I went to look down beside me, and there was no one there. And I just, it it startled me so bad, and then it hit me. The little girl I saw had long blonde hair and was wearing a nightgown that had little pink roses all over it. Uh My daughter has brown hair, and she has never owned a nightgown or anything like that. I don't know (laughs) what I invited into bed with me. (laughs) I know it was a ghost, but I just, uh, there's so many things happened in that house. That's amazing. And the dog picked up on all that. Right, yeah. Um, Unbelievable. But my my daughter experienced things, and my ex husband he never believed us until he had an experience himself. But <laughs> and I see, and that's why he's now the ex. <laughs> oh. All right, thanks, Joanna. You Thank have a good you. Halloween. What's left of it? Thank you. You too. All right, let's go east of the Rockies. Josh in Minnesota. Welcome to Coast to Coast on Ghost to Ghost, or the other way around. Hey, Josh. Hi. Go ahead, Josh. What's your story? Um. Hi, Josh. My so he takes in a place in a bar. Okay. Um, I've worked at this bar for about five years now. And this bar is pretty You're the haunted. bartender there? What do you do there? Um, well, I cook. I bartend. Cook table. everything. If whatever you have to do, you do. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I've worked there for, like I said, five years. And I know the owners pretty well. And, um, so... The one day I was there with the owner, and she had her two granddaughters with her. Okay. And the one is four, and the other one's about six. 
And the six-year-old was off playing in one of the other rooms. And Glenda, the owner, and I were standing in the kitchen, and she had to go get something out of the back room. And she took the four-year-old with her. Well, not more than 30 seconds later, she comes back with the granddaughter, and she says, Josh, take Alyssa and go back into the beer room and ask her about the man. And so I go back in the back room with her, and I go, what man? <laughs> and she goes, that man over there. And she points over towards the corner. And I go, I don't see any man. She goes, he's right there. And so about this time, I'm wondering, what is she seeing? Who is she seeing? Right. And and why can't well, I see him? Yeah. And I'm like, what's he look like? She's like, he's big. And I go, well, is he nice? She goes, no. Huh. And... About the only thing that me and Glenda could come up with was that it was one of the previous bar owners, because this bar is pretty old. It's been did, the, did the guy die in there? I've heard stories that he has, and I've heard other people say he hasn't. He didn't, I should say. And I've seen pictures of the previous bar owner, and people that knew him said he, was, he wasn't very nice. He was kind of mean. And that's, the that's owner before him was actually very nice and really liked kids. So we figured it was just a one. And oddly enough, his name is George. <laughs> I love kids. I'm a good guy. All right. Thanks, Josh. Next up, let's go to Ramon in Davenport, Iowa. Hey, Ramon. Hey, George. Um, I got a real good ghost story. It pertains to my cousin that died in the early 80s. All right. And his niece. And he's still sticking around. Um, the day he was buried, um, he came and visited by you know, his little daisy. He calls her flea bag. Flea and <laughs> and when I <laughs> and she hated it. Me no flea bag. She you know, she pretty you, I don't for I don't a blame her. She talks good. <laughs> but um <laughs> she said she told her grandma, my aunt, you know, when she you know my when my aunt asked her who who she was talking to, she said, Uncle. She my aunt goes, well, what do you say? She goes, he, he go bye-bye. He go bye-bye. He, he come play, he kiss, he go bye-bye. So and then finally when I finally, uh, got to see her just recently, and she's all grown up, I asked her, I said, have you seen him in your dreams in a, like one of those old robes that priests would wear with a hood? And she said, yeah, up until right before she turned 18, because, you know, I saw his, you know, that image. On a bridge, like that little house in the prairie, you know, one bridge that's open on the side with the roof. Right, right. He would never let me cross it because he told me, once I crossed it, I would not come back. And I was never able to see his hood or his face because it was under his hood. Because the only time I see his face is when I cross over. Now, I have a two-year-old, and ever since he was born, he, he's been talking up a storm, even as a, you know, as a newborn. And... I just put two, the two together. The other day, I realized everything that he puts on has to have a hood to put it over his head, and he's looking up, <laughs> and he's talking. And he I sees go, it. And I go, is it is it cousin of the Alfredo? He, he, go, he just points and go, uh-uh, uh-uh, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> his, his favorite cousin that's alive right now is Alex. <laughs> but he'll point up and go, Alex. And it's, I know it's, uh, it's my cousin Alfredo. I love it. Thanks for that story. Let's go to you, Sherry, in Naples, Florida, before the break. Hi, Sherry. Hi, George. How are you tonight? Good. Not bad. Happy Halloween. Oh, happy Halloween to you, too. I love your show. Thanks. So you got a good one for us here? I do. I have a very interesting one. Okay. I was getting ready to run my first triathlon. I woke up nice and early. It was around 4 in the morning, and there was nobody home. My husband was at work. And I heard three distinct knocks just out of the blue. And I was sitting at my kitchen counter, and my dog starts barking. I have three cats, 
All the cats went crazy. They're all running around the house. My bird starts flapping wildly. And then I heard what sounded like a death rattle. And I work in law enforcement, so I've kind of heard that noise before when, uh-huh. you know, somebody's last breath with that weird noise. I called my husband. I was all freaked out. I was telling him, you know, Rob, somebody died. I heard a death rattle in the house. He's like, no, it can have been. It must be your imagination. Well, 4 o'clock that evening, I get a phone call from my ex-boyfriend's sister that he died in a tragic car accident. Oh, my. And I think it was him telling me that he had passed on. And when you said, sure, you hear this death rattle, what does it sound like? It was just like a real raspy breath that just didn't sound good. And it was my sister. I called her to tell her what happened. And she said she woke up. He was a smoker. She smelled smoke at her house, like somebody was smoking cigarettes in her house. That's a great story. And I think he was telling us that he had passed up. You are now a believer in the other side, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I always have been. But that one really, it was creepy. All right. Thanks for that, Sherry. I want to take just a moment to tell you about the UFO Crash Retrieval Conference, and then we'll come right back for more Ghost to Ghost stories. Pretty chilling, by the way. It's going to be at the Tuscany Suites Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, Friday, November 7th through Sunday, November 9th. I will be there Friday, November 7th. You can register for this event at the ufoconference.com website. The meet and greet, which I will attend, will be Friday, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. So go ahead and register and come on by. And then I've got to skedaddle out of there because we've got a live program Friday night at our KXNT studios in Las Vegas. So I'm looking forward to that. It's the 2008 UFO Crash Retrieval Conference put on by the Woods. And they are doing a remarkable job. Just some of the guests Jim Mars, Nick Pope, Linda Moulton Howe will be with me, Richard Dolan, Stephen Bassett, Nicholas Redfern, Dr. Robert Wood, John Alexander, Don Schmidt, Kevin Randall, you name it. Uh, George Knapp will be the keynote speaker on uh, Saturday night. I'll be back in a moment with more of your Ghost to Ghost calls on Coast to Coast AM. Don't forget, on this weekend's Coast to Coast, we'll have Ian Punnett on Saturday and the first Sunday of the month. I'll be doing the program here as well. We'll be right back in just a moment. Ghost to Ghost continues on Coast to Coast AM. This is Dr. Bruce Goldberg, and this is my ghost story. This is a true story. An elderly patient came to my office several years ago, just a week before Christmas, reporting a very major psychic attack. She would wake up every night at 3 a.m., This is the most common time for a demonic entity to attack people. And she would see a hideous gargoyle with glaring green eyes at the foot of her bed. I began working with her with psychic protection techniques and told her that this lower astral entity could be removed if all she did was move one of her fingers during the encounter. On Christmas Eve, she again was awakened at 3 a.m. and saw this demonic gargoyle-like entity. It was at the foot of her bed and slowly crept up to her body, inch by inch, and placed its scaly long fingers around her throat and began to strangle her. She panicked. All she could hear were these weird noises, such as the rattling of chains, high-pitched screams. She could smell the odor of rotten eggs, and worse, the smell of burning flesh. Her bed now lifted off the ground and began to tip to the left and to the right. Her whole body shook with terror. She started to pray in her mind, and she remembered what I said about moving her fingers, and she slowly moved the pinky of her right hand. Suddenly, this evil being dematerialized before her eyes. Thank goodness she never saw this demon again. (laughs) Ha, 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 Bruce. You're good. West of the Rockies, let's go to Dan and Kathy. You're on Coast to Coast. Hello, you two. Hi. How you doing? Hi. So you've got something for us, huh? Oh, yeah, we got more than we bargained for. We went on the Ghosts and Legends tour at the yeah. Queen Mary. One of the, that, we were one of the first tours that, when they first started it. Okay, because I've been on that, too. I love that. I love it. I had a few encounters on it. Anyway, the main thing I'm going to talk about is, is the main one. 
which is uh, after we went through the tour, we got down into the belly of the Queen Mary, way down underwater. In the mm-hmm. boiler room. Down to the front yes. boiler room. It's, it's creepy down there. It's this huge room, and it's kind of like uh, kind of like being in a cave. It's so huge. And there, uh, the lady was, the uh, tour guide was using her, her spotlight, her little flashlight, pointing out different things and stuff. And I was kind of not quite paying attention to her. And I was kind of like about 10 feet away from everybody. And just all of a sudden, I got this real bad, like somebody, like ice, hitting up the back, my, on the back, and it went up right through the middle of my body. And all of a sudden, my T-shirt hit me in the face, <laughs> just flipped up in front of me in the face. And, and I started getting poked, and my T-shirt was being pulled around and stuff. And I'm like yelling, hey, quit that. And I left <laughs> a few F-bombs go, you know. And the, people, the rest of the people on the tour, they were like, looking at me like I was possessed, and they started backing away, you know, real slowly. <laughs> and, and it was, they were pulling on my shirt, it was, whatever it was, was pulling on my shirt and poking me. And my, my wife, I'll let her take over from here on that one. Okay. Go okay. ahead, Kathy. Well, I thought that Dan was fooling around, so I went over to see what, what was happening, if this was some sort of trick or special effect, and I felt around, there were, he didn't have any magnets or tape, there's no string, there's no wind, uh, no lasers, and um, I, when I looked at him and he was holding his arms, hands, and fingers, you know, just steady trying to keep his shirt down, not moving them, but, you know, as he, they were against his chest, so his shirt, T-shirt wouldn't go up above his head. Um, I saw the imprints of invisible thumbs and fingers flipping his shirt upward and pulling on it. Yeah, and... and- so, so I'm, I'm, I'm like twisting around still, you know, I'm going, ow, ow, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of funny because, I mean, it was, it was kind of painful but kind of funny at the same time. And, and everybody was like looking at us, you know. And the, uh, the lady, I guess, she guy kind of got tired of it, I guess. She goes, oh, that's just John. He likes blondes. John the ghost. John the ghost. That is. I love it. Oh, well, and, maybe I, when I was out there, I saw some strange stuff, too. And I, got I wasn't the, so sure what they were. And the rest of it? I got this really cold feeling on the side of my head, and I heard in my ear, I heard, I'm not John. And then the whole group heard footsteps walking away from the group. As they stood still, they were gawking. Everybody was standing still looking at me still, and you hear footsteps walking away. Everybody heard the footsteps. So go on it. (laughs) Would you take that tour again? Yes. (laughs) I (laughs) I love it. I love it. Thanks. Let's go to Mary. You are on Coast to Coast with... Ghost to ghost. Hi, Mary. Hi. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm I'm scared. What are you scared um, of? Well, what I have to tell you is a frightening story. It's the story of my life, and my life has uh, been a bit of a puzzle to me, and I've had to work to kind of figure it out. And what's going um, on? Well, there were ghosts involved in my childhood. I was uh, about three years old in 58, and I had three older sisters, and um, we lived in a ranch house, and I was sitting at breakfast when I was three years old, and my sisters were crying again to my mother once again about the, the what they had heard. They were woken in the night upstairs, and they heard the piano playing down in the basement of ghastly, horrible tune. And as much as they didn't want to go down there, they were forced to go down there as if in a trance. And they had the same experience um, oh, at least four or five times, you know, but not on the same night. But they would get um, to about the sixth step, and uh, the music would just get louder and louder, and they knew that the person who was playing it was a man named Bloody Bones. And he, he was exactly that. He um, did not have skin bloody <laughs> probably, bones yes and my sister would tell me about him on the stairs um when i was three that he lived downstairs and that he stole my mother's peas the canned peas and that he also made just one to eat children and and so when they would get to the sixth step of a woman in white would stop them and turn them around and walk them back to bed and she had a long white dress on and from what they told me she looked a lot like grace kelly when she got married and um so uh i had to live with that and my sister taught me how to get up the stairs fast if anything was going on or chairs were rocking when they shouldn't you should act as though you don't um uh 
know what's going on, but get the heck out of there. So I took my, I was playing house down there one morning, and the chair started to rock, and I acted like I didn't see what was happening. And I grabbed my baby, <laughs> and I got up those stairs within 10 seconds. And so we just sort of lived with that, and our parents told them that, that they were just having um, uh, sleepwalking problems and that they were just dreaming and that it didn't really happen. So then a few years later when they were they hit puberty, um, on Easter Sunday night they uh, had a bedroom down in the basement by then. My father had finished various rooms down there. And... Um, they were laying in bed uh, talking and making fun of people and joking, and suddenly the room became really cold, and um, we had a collie dog named Molly that was down there with her. I and bet then, she felt it, didn't she? Yeah, and she, she just uh, froze up and didn't do anything, and um, in the mirror in the room, a pinpoint of light started small, and then it grew really large, and then... They, my sister Joy, she felt the, this entity get on top of her, and um, she had a necklace that she wore all the time from uh, some friends of my parents, Margie and Al. Yeah. And they, um, and it had a little statue of Mary on it, and uh, this thing pressed down with its index finger into the hollow of her throat, um, Mary, and and uh, she, all she could do was try to cry out to God to for it to be gone. In the name. Well, that helps. That helps. Hi, this is Marianne Winkowski at the Ghostbuster. And have I got a story for you. I hardly ever tell scary stories because they're, for me, far and few between. But in our area of Cleveland, many, many years ago, we had a lot of mobsters around here. And a lot of them were killed. And I got called to a neighborhood by a family that had definitely earthbound activity in the house. So I went in, and this was, used to be one of those really beautiful neighborhoods, but, you know, lack and, and people not taking care of the houses. It was sort of gotten run down. So I get there and walked in, and it was a lady in a wheelchair. She's the lady that owned the house. Her son and daughter-in-law and two of their children lived with her, and another son lived with her. And this is how dilapidated this house was, that when I walked in, they said, be careful that you don't hit your head on the ceiling. The rain has, you know, loosened everything and is sort of falling around us. Okay, come in, sit around the table, talk about the two ghosts that are there. Typical, normal, nice family, little dysfunctional, okay. Um, and it's gotten to the point over the years that if there's any ghosts in the house, they usually come to the room that I'm sitting in. Well, there was a ghost down the basement that just had no intentions of coming upstairs. So I looked at the lady in the wheelchair, and of course there's no way she's going to go down the basement steps with me. And I looked at her two sons in their 40s, and I said, well, I need to go down the basement. And they stared at each other, and they stared at me, and they said, oh... Nobody goes in the basement. And I said, well, if you want this ghost gone, I need to go to the basement. And the one son said, well, it's off the kitchen. And I thought, <laughs> great. So I walk in the kitchen, and they said, it's the door that has the lock on it. And it was one of those old skeleton keys in the lock. And I said, why do you have this door locked? And they just said, we need to keep that door locked. So this one son is with me in the kitchen, and he says, um, okay, he says, now when you turn on the switch, there's only one light bulb on down there. If you walk into the basement farther and you sort of wave your hands in the air, you'll run across a string that's attached to another light. I said, okay. And he says, and be very careful because there's stuff piled everywhere. I said, okay. And he says, and I have to lock the door behind you. I said, what? And he says, yeah. He says, see, there's like really big rats down there, and we don't want them up here in this part of the house. I said, rats. And he said, yeah. He says, but normally they only come out at night. So I'm 
he unlocks this door, lets me start down it, and literally locks the door behind me. I'm not afraid of ghosts. I don't do rats. So I'm sort of watching and looking around to see where these rats are at. Pitch black. I'm waving my arms around like a goof. I finally find this string and pull it, and it must be like a 25-watt bulb in this thing. Junk everywhere. And musty, moldy, smelly, and... I look right in front of me, and about 10 feet in front of me, there's one of those old fruit cellar doors that are made out of plank wood, and there's a big bullseye on it, and there's bullet holes in this door, and I'm thinking, "Mm -hmm. I wonder if one of the old mafia people that used to live in this area died down here. Whoever this man was was inside that room. So I'm walking toward that room, and I there's a lasp on it. So I open that lasp up, and I go to pull that door open. It makes that crazy creak noise, you know, screeching noise. Either the floor had come up or the wood uh, did one of those things that it warps or something, but the door wouldn't open all the way. It got stuck, like, on the concrete step. And foolish me, instead of trying to pull with all my weight and open this door, I just opened it enough where I stuck my head in to see what was going on, to see if I could see anything. And son of a gun, didn't that ghost nail me? He scratched me right on the side of my neck. So I got a little angry about it. Remember, you can't give him energy, so I sort of stayed calm but angry on the inside. And I finally, you know, found out who he was, and he had worked or been involved with some mob in the 1930s or the 40s. And he had been killed down there. And so I released him, and I went up the steps, and I had to knock to let them, you know, let me come back into the kitchen. And I didn't say anything about the scratch on my neck, but there was a roll of paper towels on this thing, so I wet the paper towels, and I just sort of held them to my neck where I had gotten scratched. And I sat back down in the dining room around the table, and I told them who the gangster was and when he had died, and that he had died in that house. And did they know the history of the house? And they had not. And so I finally take the, the, paper, the, the wet paper towel down off my neck, and... I don't know. People are sort of funny. I think that I would be upset to know that a gangster was, you know, wiped out in my basement. But they started screaming, oh, my God, rats must have scratched you. Did rats jump on you downstairs? So that's my Halloween story. It's a little bit different, a little bit scary. And, you know, it's just one of those happy Halloween things. Well, I never knew I had Martians in my garden And I never knew there were aliens on my roof I got shadow people and they're living in my basement Got a funny feeling Bigfoot's gonna be here soon I was so blind before, I was so unaware But now I swear I'm seeing Sasquatch over I need to know Now I can see the light And I also see a ghost Cause I'm listening to Coast to Coast Well you never knew That your baby was a hybrid But as he grew You began to see the clues Now you know the signs Cause you learned it from George Norrie Even while you sleep Got Martians watching you. I turned on my radio in the middle of the night, and I heard things I need to know. And I can see the light, and I also see a ghost. Cause I'm listening to Coast to Coast. Good morning or good evening.
For Tom Danheiser, who executive produced this year's Ghost to Ghost, Karis Coburn, Dan Galanti, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Lattisor, Ross Mitchell, George Nappy, and Punnett and Art Bell. I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. I'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.